the strategy is silent on some important aspects of working in the Council, such as children's improvement, our agile working programme, which is called Flexible Futures, and our transformations and culture change programme called Thrive, as well as our emerging recruitment identity, the spirit of Herefordshire. On 28th November 2022, the Scrutiny Management Board considered Herefordshire Council's human resources and workforce strategy. The SMB has asked for the development of the next workforce strategy to be brought forward by a year to September 2023 for launch in April 2024. The purpose of which is to be able to build on the Council's key ambitions and integrate the county, the county plan priorities into the strategy as part of a golden thread. Central to this new strategy will be a theme of a one council approach and grow our own to achieve a one council culture and success for our county. This requires new ways of thinking and working across the council. We have therefore undertaken extensive internal engagement with the workforce to inform a new workforce strategy and external benchmarking has taken place to develop and align the workforce priorities to the council's vision. This strategy sets out how we recruit, retain and support our workforce and ensure that we have the skills and capabilities we need to deliver services in new ways. As a result, the workforce strategy has been completely reviewed and rewritten and it is proposed at the same time that the Council will introduce new core values and behaviours that will underpin the six emerging and holistic workforce priorities, which are culture and belonging, employee experience, well-being and engagement, inspirational leadership, agile and adaptive workforce, and learning and development. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that the Scrutiny Management Board are asked to note the content of the report and provide any views or recommendations on the emerging screens of, of the strategy. Thank you very much. Um, right, I'll... Um I'll open up to questions from uh, committee members. Does anybody want to go first? Councillor Baker. Uh, thank you. Um, blimey. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, reading uh, th this vast report over the weekend, 32 pages, as I remember, um, was, was a struggle. However, I managed to find something in there that, uh, that gave me s some concern was this one council approach staff work within their directorate but are able to work across other directorates now that gives me problems in so much will this be compulsory will staff members be sent somewhere else I'm thinking of some hard-working member of staff working in finance for example suddenly on Monday that person is told to go and work for waste services um, against their wishes. And some, I think this needs to be rethought, this particular uh, paragraph. And uh, it should be along the lines of um, it's, it, it's a matter of requests and, uh, and negotiation rather than compulsory or possible threats uh, or pressure put on to move. I've seen it done in other organisations and it's not something we want to be doing in Herefordshire Council. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Councillor Baker, I think there might have been some uh, some leaps of assumption there in terms of uh, you joining some dots that might not might not uh, uh, actually uh, be appropriate to join. Please, um, could uh, Cabinet member and or officers um, provide some clarification there? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Baker, for your question. I'll now ask Rachel to address that, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Absolutely, there's been a slight uh, misinterpretation of that sentence, but nonetheless, if it does seek to require clarification, we will absolutely do that. Um, what we mean is we... Sorry, can uh, you just clarify? Did I misread it? You did. So you read it, but you've misinterpreted, I think, the, the, what the sentiment that is behind that sentence. So what we, what we mean and what we aim to do is um, staff overwhelmingly have asked us to invest in retention, growing their careers within the council, 
part of that is around skills development, capability development. And one way of doing that is for those that wish to, absolutely not compulsory, or making people move outside of their roles, is by offering shadowing opportunities, mentoring opportunities, opportunities to get involved in cross-directorate project work that does grow their skills and experience. And therefore, they make conscious career decisions to move outside of their directorates. Councillor Baker. Great. Um, could I ask a follow up question to that? Um, you know, I, I've worked in um, in market sectors where there has been um, secondment from other organisations um, or between organisations. Um, I mean, particularly my experiences in the defence sector where. Um, uh, members of defence companies went on secondment into um, MOD main building and similarly um, there were uh, there were opportunities for secondment the other way. Um, is that something that we've explored with um, local employers in, in, uh, in the area to see whether there is scope both for um, uh, providing um, uh, work experience, um, sort of career uh, development, um, seconding people into the council from local employers and similarly giving our staff the opportunity to experience um, business and commercial um, uh, operating environments with local employers. Um, it may be that that provides a route to access um, skills and expertise that may be helpful to either local employers or indeed to, to us um, at potentially not the same sort of rates as maybe we're buying interims in for, um, from the uh, local government sector. Uh, is that something that's been looked at? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it is actually quite a fundamental part of the proposed next year three year plan um, as part of that Grow Our Own campaign. So in terms of um, early discussions with the ICS, um, the Integrated Care um, System and Board around the NHS and other different um, care sector providers there are taking place. Um, we need to go out to local employers outside of those discussions that have already taken place, but it's something that we absolutely want to make sure we embed as part of that um, career development piece. Um, Already the conversations that are taking place are around those transferable skills, so we're, we're linking up and exploring coaching and mentoring opportunities so staff can experience in, both inside and outside of the, the sector as well as their division as well. So it will be a key fundamental part, but we're very much in the early stages of conversation and there is far more to follow. Okay, thank you very much. Cabinet member. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, th the key thing that we want to do is, of course, to make Herefordshire Council an employer of choice for local employee people. And that's why we're looking to ensure that mentoring is there, we, we're, we're trying to be as flexible as possible, but speaking to our, a lot of our employees, they wish to have the ability to be, they're intrinsically driven, they wish to be invested in, and that's what uh, the strategy that Rachel and Tracy have put together is, de is dealing to do, is to address those issues, so those ind individuals who wish to can progress, those who wish to stay as they are, they can do. There, there's nothing to pick up on the Councillor Baker's point. No, there's nothing that you have to progress, but if you wish to, and maybe change career paths, that's another option that you can have. Because obviously the key thing is, if we can retain our good quality people, it's a lot better than trying to recruit and bring in through, as you know, the cost of, of, of churn can be quite expensive. Thank you. Um, committee members, Councillor Cornthwaite, then Councillor Fagin, then Councillor Chowns. On um, the item 15D, it talks about a gender pay gap that is still not, um, we still haven't closed it. Uh, I find it really, really hard to believe that there would be anywhere in society where the gender pay gap hasn't been closed. Um, and it says that you still need to look at points to address this. Could you give us some idea of when this will happen? Because it's quite a surprise. Uh, Councillor Conflict, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's actually a point that Tracy and uh, 
and Rachel will, will, will remember back in a few months ago, it was one of the very points I picked up on, the gender pay gap. Why do we have such a thing? But actually a lot of it, I'll leave the, the detail down to, to, uh, to Rachel to explain, but it's down to the fact it tends to be uh, females tend to be left behind from having children. So it can, they can have career uh, lapses in there and also because of children requirements and not being sexist here, but the bottom line is that they tend to work part time. And that's where it comes down to. But I'll let uh, Rachel now give you a bit more detail. Thank you. So it is a whole separate reporting piece of work that does need to take place because it is so prominent and important a theme that we, we need to address it. Um, lots of emerging research and, and, and national work that's taking place is that we, we need to build an inclusive culture um, and target different interventions, but not necessarily I, I, um, at, the, at the, the female gender. So part of the evidence that's emerging is we need to do more around flexibility around male gender that then will therefore, it sounds counterproductive, doesn't it, in terms of counterintuitive, but the more we do around generalising flexibility and offering opportunities to, to our male workforce, we'll ironically then close the gap. But part of this report is around the different ways of working, and we are, again, this is the point of the workforce strategy, that we, it will require a lot of different thinking, work and intervention over the next three years to absolutely strive to close that gap. And also mentioned as well that one of the points I was asking was, uh, when we look at the gender gap, is it is it that employee A, who's male, and employee B, who's female, doing the same job, get paid different rates, and it isn't. They get paid the same rate. It's the conditions and t and uh, and amount of hours they can do. That's what causes that gender gap. Councillor Fagan. Um, thank you. If, if I can just go back to the, um, the, the point about um, growing your own. Um, I can't see apprenticeships um, actually mentioned in the workforce strategy, and they might be there, but also when I went on the Spirit of Herefordshire web page, I couldn't see any reference to apprenticeships. And um, so I'm quite interested to know how we're engaging with learning partners such as schools, further education colleges, uh, universities, to encourage young people who are already invested in the county to actually uh, train and develop here. Um, so, so I'm there. I'm back on. Okay, uh, so, and and I'm wondering who our partners are in in terms of that with the workforce strategy and and how we're actually engaging with them. I've, I've got a couple of questions, but I think that that was um, the the key one. If I it, would it be helpful just if I itemize the the questions? Is is that is that okay, or shall I? Um, and, and then also I just wondered uh, where the information is about the pipeline of careers because obviously if people start off in the council and want to develop their careers here, how do they know how, you, how they do that? Um, so things like you know fast track programs, um, corporate management and leadership development programs and step up op opportunities. Um, I'd be interested to know a bit more about those. Um, and also, I just wanted to point out, I mean, it, it's great to retain top talent, but I think also what about ordinary talent and dedication and diligence? Because not everybody can be top talent, but actually what we also need to do is um, uh, retain all workers and enable them to actually develop their talent. So I think those three points sort of feed into the same theme. Thank you. So if I take apprenticeships to start off with, um, whilst m maybe not explicitly mentioned in the report, it's absolutely a thread throughout the, the draft workforce strategy. And the reason that the committee haven't seen it today is it's not yet been shared with the workforce, so we didn't want that to, to come ahead of um, internal yeah. consultation. Um, in terms of um, work experience, we've got a new programme, we're working with schools um, in terms of um, addressing work experience and providing those pathways. In terms of the apprenticeships, I can provide a written response with the information, but we, we, we're doing really well with our levy spend at the moment. Um, schools are heavily engaged, as are internal council um, colleagues, in terms of taking up the, the apprenticeships um, levy, albeit we're still looking at where there are career um, workforce gaps in terms of hard-to-fill roles, targeting um, those career pathways. Um, on the spirit of Herefordshire point, um, 
the Royal Career Pathways work has started predominantly in children's and young people, but we're widening that out to other career pathways in terms of leadership and management. And a piece of work we're actively involved in at the current time is scoping up our new leadership and management development programmes that will sit alongside, so that will be a learning pathway that will sit alongside a career pathway. And whether that is the depth that somebody wants to explore or stretch, or just internal promotion through the traditional hierarchical ranks of um, line management, um, we're mapping all of that. Again, it's not a rush. Um, part of the um, spirit of Herefordshire and the Thrive Culture Transformation Plan, um, the reason it's so important that we align and we make sure that golden thread is that takes time to culturally build and develop and get people, one, interested and engaged and starting to talk about their career development if they've not already. So it is integrated. We'd welcome the conversation or, or feedback, and it's nice to hear the feedback and that thought process. In terms of fast track, again, we, we are going to be as part of the strategy looking at further opportunities. And the council this year have made a start by joining up the um, local government associations fast track um, graduate program of which we've appointed three graduates this year. So something that we're looking at, what we're doing, how we're growing our own in, in those ways. Um, and I will take the point about top talent. All talent is talent um, in, in so much as everybody's unique. So, um, yes, we do want to be known as an employer of choice where we are attracting very talented people. But it depends on the role. And actually what we really want is robust workers and line managers who are doing their jobs well for Herefordshire. Thank you. Um, I, I think that... The the, just the point about the spirit of Herefordshire, I think it would be really useful to have something on there about apprenticeships and, you know, if young people are actually looking at what they're going to be doing, if there's some information there to say, yeah, you know, you could actually develop your career here, um, because it's an opportunity because it's the site is, is up and running. Um, I just wanted to ask furthermore, if I, if I could, just about the how the strategy aims to address the um, workforce race equality standards. Um, the first theme in the in the strategy is culture and belonging, which is predominantly it is equality, um, inclusion, and diversity. So lots of targeted interventions, whether that be from terms and conditions reviews, workforce development initiatives, um, underrepresented groups. We want to absolutely invest in our different networks, so where we are attracting um, a diverse um, workforce and retaining, nonetheless, a diverse workforce. So I can't answer specifically in terms of the initiatives we've got lined up, but actually it's a, it's a really key, key theme. Um, we are working with our employee networks that represent the, the several protected characteristics and we're going to be going out to ask more of our workforce. The networks have been quite fundamental in the shaping of the strategy, so have put forward their ideas and suggestions over the next three years that we can help address that very issue. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, I've just got one other point on that because it's about overseas. It is also how we do, um, help overseas staff develop with, you know, with, within the county. So it was, um, the, the question was really how, um, I'm just trying to look at the question, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so how do we deal with the recruitment and appropriate development of overseas staff? And I assume we, we are uh, currently still looking at overseas staff, if, if I may be wrong. Thank you, Chair. Um, we don't currently have an overseas recruitment campaign that's live at the moment, but it is something we are considering for next year, potentially for children's services. And if and when we do, we intend to learn um, from our neighbours, because I know the NHS have a very robust campaign. Finished, Councillor Fagan. I am for, for now. I've got, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'll just see if... Okay, they're that's, covered by the others. That's great. Councillor Chowns. Thank you. Thanks very much for the report. Thank you, Councillor Stoddart, and thank you, Rachel. Um, just a couple of points. So um, I, I, I like this report. I found it to be 11 pages, not 32, but, you know, horses for courses. Um, uh, I, I felt that, for me, the key bit, there's a couple of bits I want to comment on. The first is Para 19, which I think is page 13, which is where you're setting out these kind of six themes. 
So that seems to me to be the core of what you're talking about here. And broadly, I really like them. They're great, and it's really clear from the report that they emerge from kind of wide consultation with staff members. So I think that's all really positive. I wonder if there's a little bit, and I know you haven't yet finished the kind of finessing. So I was, for me, that they're a wee bit wordy and there's a bit of overlap. And I think they could benefit from a little clarification. So, for example, number one seems to me to be all about the word inclusive, really. Um, but then you've got kind of, you know, inclusive talked about under number two as well. And um, you've got engaging talked about in number three. And that, to me, is covered already in... Sorry, A, B, A and B. Do you see what I mean? And I felt that, you know, culture and belonging is just it's sort of a vague area or something. But if you say, you know, our objective is to be an inclusive organisation, that says really clearly on the tin what it is that is kind of the, the core value of our organisation. So to me, I would, you know, try and come up with six adjectives that really describe what we want to be, you know, inclusive, dynamic, um, supportive, well-led, uh, you know, uh, responsive or adaptable or something and learning focused. I couldn't think of one from the sixth one that gets it in just one word. But you, if you see what I mean. So I think there's a little bit of work to be done there. But to me, they really ca capture what I have seen in the council of the efforts to, you know, support our, our workforce. And I really, I, I really appreciate that. So that's great. Um, I'm not quite so this is my slight, this is my sort of improvement point, really. Um, so in the appendices, so there are three pages of um, sort of PowerPoints in the appendix, and the second page of that, the Emerging Thrive Values one, which is page, mm, what is it in our papers, 22. Um, <coughs> so somebody's clearly made a bit of an effort to come up with words that begin with T, H, R, I, V, and E. And I'm, I'm afraid my heart sank like a stone when I saw this, because <coughs> what, what's happened is that the, the presentation is all attempting to be about style, i.e. the letter that the word begins with, rather than about the substance of the content. So for me, it totally doesn't sit with your six values. It kind of... It, it's just such an obvious effort to find words that begin with the same letter that I think it's not terribly helpful. It's a distraction. So I'd really encourage moving away from that clarifying what are the actual what's the core of the substance of what we want to our workforce values to be and just communicating that never mind what the acronym ends up being i hope that's helpful thank you well thank you and i'm sure we'll uh, we'll have that debate a little bit later on as we go back into into transformation <laughs> it'll be the same words that will come out but thank you uh, uh for those very uh, useful comments and we'll we'll take them forward and uh, we'll get our uh, our lexicon and dictionary out and uh, and get some better words so thank you <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I could, um, if I could excuse myself and just hop in with a with a follow up on uh, on on that one, um, I didn't mind the word clouds. Um, I I, <laughs> I did I didn't have the visceral reaction that Councillor Chowns did to to them. Uh, and partly, I think um, for me that was because I really didn't like the P E O P L E um, uh, acronym previously. Um, for me, the good thing about the word clouds is, and I, I, I take the point about, um, you know, homing in on the acronym and then word searching around, around the letters. But if the words, um, together kind of give a, a, a flavor of the kind of ways in which we want people to act, how we want people to feel, um, how we want people to be treated, um, you know, there are going to be words in those little clouds that resonate with people and, you know, they're not always going to be the same words. We're not going to find a single word which is going to nail it for everybody. So I wasn't so sort of caught up on, on, on that and I quite <coughs> liked the the sort of the flexibility that that provided for people to identify with different words and phrases within those those clouds while while still kind of having that thrive acronym um, and the overall <coughs> message that that meant in fact I went on the I was so sad that I went on the council website and actually searched on the word thrive um, to see just how many times it it 
it appears in things that we say we want to do. And I think that's almost kind of before we honed in on it as an acronym for this, that we were already talking about having ambitions for the county and the people who live here to thrive, for our businesses to thrive. Um, so I, I quite like that. Um, uh, but uh, I've got a but now, <laughs> like as the chance, uh, an improvement point. Um, for me, it, it kind of raised um, a bit of a question about um, how we walk that talk. Um, because, you know, we can put all that stuff out there, uh, but the organisation is kind of made up of not fairy stories, but, but you know, stories about things that actually happen on the ground to real people. And the most powerful way in which we can demonstrate that we're genuine about this is by walking that, that talk. So... On the one hand, you know, fair criticism and tough feedback, you know, difficult to hear, though that might be sometimes, are things that we should welcome and encourage um, if we're going <coughs> to understand and learn from our mistakes. And, you know, we do make mistakes. We all do. Um, so for me, how are, we, how are we planning to encourage more um, of this from our staff? Because... You know, there's a lot of learning to be had from that sort of feedback from our staff um, uh, and from others. And alongside that, what are, what are we doing to challenge the sort of unfair criticism and in some instances even I would call it hate speech um, towards the council and its employees that we see online, in social media, um, you know, that in the press when they get the wrong end of the stick about, you know, decisions that are, uh, are coming up. Um, and that people, because that makes people afraid and reluctant to talk positively about their work and about the council as an employer. Um, and how are we going to walk that talk on these themes so that staff have the confidence that they are safe to raise issues and also to try new things? Uh, that they're supported when things are tough and that we are forgiving when people try and sometimes fail. You know, when we're not going to know whether we're stretching <coughs> ourselves unless, you know, we do sometimes try something and fail and that it's okay to do that. Thank you, Councillor. That's uh, a very valid uh Good points there. The first thing I'd say is on the um, the fair criticism and and, uh, and tough feedback. I think sits very much in the inspirational leadership bit. We we have leaders and we expect our leaders to inspire, uh, to lead in a open, honest, and transparent manner. But that doesn't mean that there are soft touches. What it means is that they where things need doing, they will get in and do it. They have the moral compass to see what's right and what's wrong. Uh, and that means that when they lead their teams, they're leading them, uh, not quite like my background as an army officer, but you're, you're leading a team who wish to follow you, not because they have to follow you. They will follow you that way. So I think that's part of that. And that's what we'll be developing with our, our leaders is that we'll be doing inspirational training. Um, but as I say, fair criticism and, 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 hard, and hard feedback is, is part of that. You've got, to, you've got to have that honesty with your employees. There's no point in giving platitudes out when actually it, it's wasteful. Uh, so that's on that side. I'll hand across to Rachel, uh, sorry, to, uh, to Rachel just to cover some of the other points there. Um, thank you, Chair, for the really thorough feedback. Um, a saying that I say a lot, the time in OD, actions speak louder than words, and we're talking about behaviours. So despite the values that are on the page, I absolutely concur with you that it's what do we observe every day? How do we walk the walk in terms of your ter terminology? Um, just in first of the word clouds, this represents 300 people's views when they were asked around what is the culture, um, albeit we did ask them to, to fit it in to, to thrive um, from that perspective. So this is what people are saying, and there is an element of, so this is what it's like to work here, it's real, because the other thing we need to be absolutely careful of when we 
define our values, our, our behaviours and the workforce strategies, we don't sell something that is not real. So we go out and we attract talent and when they get here, it is not as what they, they expected in terms of, um, and that will create a bigger disconnect with the workforce moving forward. Um, so we haven't quite nailed the values yet. We are particularly struggling around the V. Is it is it vibrant? Is it visionary? Is it value? And there's lots of things that we can absolutely embrace from that perspective. Um, alongside the mapping of the core values, we are doing a piece around behaviours and how are we going to absolutely embed that into a whole <coughs> system approach. So what do our policies say? What is the leadership and management development and responsibilities? What is it about being a Herefordshire council member of staff how do we want you to work how do we want you to behave and, and act um, and absolutely right the way from um, well, all, all stakeholders all members of the council in terms of um, that those actions those behaviors that we expect them to see um, the empathy one is particularly strong as is the, the trust nice that they sit on the 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 end of that that thrive word there because actually we, we need do need trust in relationships um, and it is about holding people to account, but it's also about being fair and transparent and telling people what we expect of them. And all of the wraparound initiatives that we've got will absolutely need to change and then embed in terms of the, the new approach moving forward. Um, I hope that answers the question. There's a lot behind your feedback there and, and for your response. If I can go back as well, sort of things that I'd like to see in the inspirational leadership would be, as part of that empathy thing, is, uh, is emotional intelligence. So you actually can understand when you're speaking with people how you're being perceived and, and, and have that empathy with them. I'd also then talk about behaviours. And it's a simple thing that uh, through my adult life, I, I've always spoken and dealt with people the way that I would like them to deal with me. And I think that's a very simple, fundamental bit that yeah, everybody in this organisation has the, has the right to, to be spoken to in a pleasant, easy manner. That doesn't mean, as I say, it's a warm, fluffy cloud, that if there is a mistake then you, that f that's where the fair criticism and the, f and the strong feedback comes back and you take it on the chin. But that's where that transparent relationship you have as a leader to your members of staff. Thank you. Could I, could I follow that up then just, just quickly? Um, sometimes it's only when people have committed to leave the organisation. Um, Tracy knows what I'm going to say now. <laughs> She's smiling already. Uh, um, that they feel free to be candid about worries and concerns about how the organisation has, has treated them or, or things that they have seen. So with that in mind, have we used information gathered from staff exit interviews to identify and address issues with how we treat and manage our staff that contribute to people leaving the organisation? And can we point to examples within the strategy that stem from that learning? In, in previous business employments I've had, a uh, 360 degree learning is, is very vital. And uh, much as you would like to think that the, the culture of an organisation you have is encourages feedback, it's, it, as you say, as someone leaves, that is really where maybe uh, you're getting a complete 100% honesty of an opinion. And certainly any organisation I've ever been in, those, those points are actually taken forward fed back into the operational chains to try and improve. But I'll pass across to, to Rachel to see if she has any other points. So the exit information was used as a desktop exercise to help inform the teams. Um, so, so that has been undertaken. Um, without going through the strategy as it is, I do remember one explicit point. So in, in some of the um, exit feedback was around flexibility. People were asking for a little bit of flexibility within their roles and they'd left because they hadn't even had that conversation. Um, with, without that, and they were making that assumption um, that it wasn't for them in their role. So within the, um, the one piece around change and adapti adaptability is a theme around um, making sure that there's transparent skills, exploring those conversations and looking at flexibility. That's the one explicit one at the top of my head I can think of that was used. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've, yeah, I've got Councillor Stark and then uh, Councillor Matthews. Uh, well, I've got Councillor Crockett, then um, <coughs> Councillor Cornthwaite again, and Councillor Fagan. And Councillor Baker as well. Ah, and Councillor Baker. My goodness, many, many okay. Questions. Right. And then we might need to pause and see where we are on time. Yeah, thank you, Chair. 
Um, the workflow strategy isn't a strategy just for itself. I mean, that's one of my worries here is it can become too internally focused. And what struck me about this workflow strategy, which is an update, and I'm, I'm pleased to see the update because we did scrutinise this in the previous SMB, is I didn't see a question in it that said, how can a, the employees actually do their job better? What is it they need to do their job better? And that's one of the concerns I've got, and I did raise it at the previous scrutiny meeting, which is how we link the workforce strategy to the county and delivery plan and to our business priorities. Usually it's the other way around council order. Usually you have your business objectives, you look at the skill sets you need, you look at the cultures and values and underlying support and HR mechanisms you need to deliver that, and that emerges into a complete whole where you have your business side and you have your workforce strategy, including leadership and, and teamwork and everything else, that supports those business priorities. And it struck me that that simple question, what can I actually, what do I need to do my job better, would have been a nice question to ask employees. And you may have already have asked them, but it didn't come out. And I do know that you have picked up on trying to develop a strand between the, this is paragraph 15, between the various uh, plans, the county plan, delivery plan, which chair are very much still in uh, development at the moment because we've got a new administration. And again, I still have got that question to pose on the table today. How are we going to show that this strategy is going to deliver what we need delivered for our, for our uh, county plan and for our delivery plan? And I do know they do talk about KPIs and they do talk about uh, trying to link the two to get the success measures from it. But it's still not clear to me, Chair, from, from this updated version that we've still got clarity in that. So that's a couple of things around how this strategy beds into the various other plans that, that we're taking forward in terms of business priorities and outcomes, of course. And certainly, did we actually ask employees what they thought they needed to do their job better? Thank you. Okay, thank, thanks, Councillor Stahl. I think it, it's, I suppose in one sense, it's, um, it's helpful to know that this is very much um, a work in progress. Um, and that it is progressing alongside the development of the county plan, the timeline that we've got elsewhere in the uh, in the agenda, and the delivery plan for that will follow on. Um, but uh, yeah, if we can get some assurance from cabinet member and officers. But thank you, uh, Councillor Stark. It's a very valid point. So first of all, we'd say that uh, in paragraph thirteen of the report, it talks about the sessions and uh, and what questions were asked and. Uh, one of them was, what would you like to see introduced and what should we be doing more of? Uh, what do you think should be our workforce priority? So they were part of those questions. But to pick up on your point about the internally focused, it is, it's, 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 it's our strategy for our workforce. Uh, and I pick up on there, you've got the agile and adaptive workforce and the learning and development. So what we're saying is we want to develop our workforce, but they, we want them to have an agile uh, and, and adaptive so they can change and deliver what we wish as we go forward. Uh, the specifics of, of the, the requirements of individual jobs will be in, in uh, job descriptions and things within uh, uh, operational plans. Um, but as I say, you know, you're quite right, it, it, it will be linked and you'll, you'll, we'll be talking, I think it's this next item, we'll be talking about the delivery plan. So we'll talk about county plan then. Uh, but very much it's, uh, it is internally focused because it's it's our it's our strategy. Rachel, would you like to say a few things? I think not much more to ha to add to that. The, in the approach was very much around appreciative inquiry, so it was focused around what do you need. Um, so that came out of it was question B: what do you see, like to see introduced? What more that we can do? The other piece of um, quite hard data and evidence that we had in June 2022, we undertook our bi biennial employee survey and there was a large chunk of that was around learning and development and quite a lot of that was around what do you need to do your jobs well, where do we need to go, so a lot of that data is still relevant, we're on a two year action plan to deliver that and that was used to inform the, the strategy as well because it was still up to date and relevant and absolutely assurance that we will work with Amy and the wider corporate leadership team to align the county plan to the strategy. And, and beyond that, how are we going to measure the success of this strategy in terms of delivery? Well, 
I would suggest that one of the things that I would look as a KPI is the, the amount of staff churn that we would have. Uh, I understand it's it's pretty low already, uh, but we can put in uh, a measure that we can put in to say we, we would measure uh, n amount of uh, churn over a one or a three year period. If I might just add to that, um, the, the strategy is obviously well formed um, as it is and in the draft we have um, measures of success for every theme within the draft that we've got at the moment. So that is a point that we've picked up. We absolutely do want to be able to demonstrate that we've achieved something or if we haven't then we can pick it up and do something about it. <coughs> and that will be reported back through the normal channels through the cabinet and everything else so we'll know what's going on as councillors. Okay, thank you. Thank you Councillor Stark. Councillor Matthews. Thank you, Chair. I'll be very brief because, as you said, time's going on. <clears throat> the Cabinet member quite rightly said you only get the truth, the old truth, and nothing but the truth when people are leaving. Um, I've <clears throat> we've lost so many Isley Valley staff uh, who have taken early retirement over recent years and left a big, big hole in this council, mainly because they tell me, this is what they tell me, they could no longer tolerate the way the council was generally being run and the lack of supervision and management. <coughs> because if you've got frontline staff working hard, taking responsibility, it's essential that they know they've got the supervision and the support from above, and that, that's made known and, and, and thing. So I'd like the officer's uh, view on that. <coughs> the other thing is, uh, again, the cabinet members and others have mentioned, uh, promote internally. It's absolutely imperative that we must have talented staff locally, that those people are given the right consideration when it comes to promotion. We're promoting and bringing in far too many people from way off, a lot of them from rur urban authorities who haven't got the first idea about rural councils and how they're run. So there's a lot to be uh, done there. So I think that uh, uh, um, promote internally, as the cabinet member said, is something that we should encourage and support. And as, as other people have said, recruit our staff locally as wherever we can, because you get far more enthusiastic workers. Because I think you'll see that in other <coughs> public bodies, like the police and health service, it all falls down for the lack of proper leadership from the top. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Matthews. Uh, what I would say there is that we address that in the inspirational leadership, and I've alluded to it a few times. We, we are expecting, uh, and, and our leaders will have KPIs on them to ensure that they are doing what they're meant to be doing. And through that aspect, as I say, we're looking for empathetic leaders, but that doesn't mean they're soft touches. They will be taking those harsh decisions, and the CLT will support them, and that's quite fu fundamental. I've found that they need to be given this, the... In, in the way that they need to lead their teams, they need to know that they're getting the support all the way through, and, th and that, through the strategy and the, and the current CLT, will follow through. Secondly, the, the promotion, as you can see, is in the learning development, and as, tr uh, as uh, Rachel has alluded to, as we go through, uh, picking up on one of Council Stark's points, if they're doing something and they're not, they're, they perceive that they've got a gap in their skills to deliver what they're doing, we must ensure that they have the confidence to come back through to their leadership and say, I, I, I'm doing this, but I, can't, I haven't got the skill to do it, and we will then look to train them. And, and, and that encourage that, that, that discussion between the team leaders and the, uh, and the staff. Chair, if I could just very briefly, um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, fellow chairman, that uh, uh, with children's services, Ofsted are ominous for lack of supervision and proper management. And that's been a weakness there for years. And that's where we've got to take <coughs> uh, right through this council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Councillor Crockett and then Councillor Cole, did you want to come in? Thank, thank you, Chair. No. Then uh, Councillor Cornthwaite then. No? Thank you. Um, um, yeah, Councillor Stoller, ab absolutely right. Progression and succession planning is paramount in a, in a good establishment. So um, we need to do that. My main concern is through recruitment and retention, and we go on about this all the time. Um, Councillor Fagan already mentioned um, growing our own apprenticeships, etc. but we need to do it. We're not actually doing a lot. We're saying a lot all the time, 
and we need to get people interested in, in our workforce. Um, so good positive um, reactions from, even if it's social media, we need those. Um, the main concern, like I said, is recruitment and retention, and that thread flowed through yesterday's um, Healthcare and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, where adult services were really concerned about this area. Uh, the risk and cost of the implications and inability to care for people at home uh, is, a, is an ongoing and growing situation, and we really got to encourage people to stay here. Um, lots of things have already been answered. I was thinking about the pay gap and also, um, uh, what is the other thing? I wondered whether we could do taster days or... Um, try before you buy sort of theory uh, to see if people want to, you know, they come and work for the, the council and then they think, gosh, that's not what I thought it was. And I know we used to get that at the hospital. Um, so I think taster days might be a good um, improvement. But thank you again for a good report. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Crockett. Uh, if I can address the recruitment and retention, it's, uh, as I've alluded to earlier, it's staff churn is, is bad, uh, and more importantly, if we can retain our own and train and bring them through, it saves the recruitment, and as a cabinet member for finance, uh, I'm only too keen to be prudent and save money wherever possible, at any point. Uh, so there's that one that you know, we will try to do. One thing that I'd be very keen to see is, and I've discussed with Tracy, is uh, degree apprenticeships, I think, are something that would be very useful, because uh, I think it's, it's work while you train, and, and actually has a very useful profile for, for young people to come through and get a degree without any uh, burden of financial uh, costs at the end. So I, I'd be very, very keen, I think that could be a, a USP we could maybe try and offer some of our young people coming through. Taste of days, I'll, I'll hand across to Rachel and see what she can do on there. Uh, um. If I might, can I just mention something on apprenticeships? Yeah. Um, I, I just, I think the point you made, um, given council, was it um, that we, we say a lot about apprenticeships, but we don't do a lot. And I, I just wanted to clarify, we currently have 83 active apprenticeships right now. And I think apprenticeships is something that we do quite a lot of. We're using our levy really well, but I think it's under the radar and people don't see it so much. So there's probably more we can do on publicising that and making sure that people are aware of it. 83, I think, is one of our best numbers we've ever had. Yeah, I do know that there was a, an underlying, but it's so that people know this is this is the point. Thank you. Um, could I call Councillor Hamlin? Did you have a? Ah, right. Okay. Um, in that case, uh, Councillor Cornthwaite, then Councillor Fagin, and then finally Councillor Bartlett. What, one of the ways I feel you could help. Um, in, within the schools is um, that you had somebody that attended when the, the schools want to do mock interviews. I've yet to see that um, somebody from the council is there. It, uh, I do it as a businessman. And if you did it at, I think, is it year 11, where, the, where they're just about to leave school before they go to college, then you give them, a, you can start to feed a career path which you will then pick them up when you get to sixth form, because I'm sure you do do something when they get to that part. If I might, um, that's something I've personally done myself in the past in another authority, and I, it's been really valuable. So I, I would personally be very happy to do that myself, and we could run that as a programme. Really happy that we participate in that. What could also be very useful there on that aspect to, to, is to get our leaders engaged in it because actually it's good for the inspirational leadership bit to actually go in and actually start doing interviews and uh, and speaking with the young people thank you councillor fagan um thank you i, th I think um for, for me one of the key questions is about culture so we hear this in children's uh, scrutiny a lot about how difficult it is to change the culture and how uh, that takes time and and i think you know there's a lot of work going on around that but i know that it's still an issue and so so the question is really um about that uh, looking at what has any external support been taken to actually address the issue of culture change, particularly within children's services? So that's um, one one aspect of it. And uh, in on 
page 11.13, uh, uh, it said, describe the current and future culture of the Council and what values should we embrace in the future. So I'd be quite interested just to hear what the feedback was on that um, and whether this issue, this the perception that there is a culture issue within the Council is, is sort of being acknowledged uh, w within the strategy and that that feedback's come back from the staff. And um, and I, I, the the final point was really just about, you know, if if we look at the the council as a business, and then we look at the client, I mean, obviously that issue around workforce is the client is key to that as well. Um, and so, really, have have the public been part uh, involved in this engagement at all? And and particularly as um, we would be hoping that many of them would become part of the workforce. So I think it's just that that sort of uh, council public engagement issue as well, which also re relates to the culture. Thank you, Councillor Fagan. Uh, what I can say is uh, the, the the feedback that you, you that you mentioned uh, it's there. We just haven't got that information to hand. So uh, we will provide you with a written response with some of that feedback, and I'll hand across to Rachel for the others. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so, first, in response to the public, no, the public had not been consulted, um, predominantly because this is a, an internal strategy. Um, part of the data, I suppose, tangibly that you could link to the public being consulted is we did look at um, when people come through recruitment, we asked them where they found their jobs and, 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 and various other information. So we've used that to inform the desk type, but not, not explicitly um, a public consultation. Um, I'm not, I'd have to think that through a little bit more because I don't think it was fundamentally appropriate. What we have done is we've benchmarked quite heavily against other organisations within Herefordshire and wider in terms of workforce strategies. Um, in terms of then the um, feedback on the culture, Councillor Stoddart has answered, we've got lots of information that came through all of those sessions. So happy to, to um, provide the written response. Thanks. I think the, the key part of the question was how, how we're addressing that, that issue of cultural change wi within the workforce and particularly within children's services, which is, is such a, a, an enormous issue. Um, as part of the Children's Improvement <coughs> Board um, project, there's a work stream, there's the workforce work stream, and one of the projects underneath that is specifically dealing with culture. Rachel is leading it jointly. I think is it with Rachel or Stuart? Yeah. Um, and, and Gail Hancock in children's services. So there is a specific piece of work to um, to deal with the cultural issues that we have in children's and make it a better place to work. Um, and I think working with we're, we're taking our steer. I think from Leeds, we're working in partnership with our, our improvement um, partner. Um, and is there any more you want to say on that, um, Rachel? Because that's in its early days still. In its early days, um, there is some work that's already happened with children's DMT at a high level with Leeds, and we're waiting for that then now to think through next steps. The one part of the call to change is children's and young people are also jointly working upon their um, own directorate strategy, and we've spoken with them and aligned it to the emerging council-wide strategy. So all of it as an holistic piece is addressing culture, um, but explicitly the workforce needs to be start to be formed, to be shaped, working with Leeds moving forward. And Chair, sorry, can I just quickly ask, is the children's workforce strategy separate to this workforce strategy? Okay. Um, it is because there's some very direct challenges and needs at children's, the same as there will be at community wellbeing and DE and &E, um, eventually. We need to make sure there is that golden thread to the overall council strategy, but different initiatives might take a different form dependent upon the directorate and the type of workforce and indeed their residents and clients. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Bartlett. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentations and uh, to the rest of my colleagues for their input. Um, I, um, Councillor Fagan, that's quite interesting, that last point about the fact that some of the work strategies are going to be slightly different um, as the, because of the focus they need. And also to Councillor Stark as well for bringing up about the KPIs. Um, so thank you very <coughs> much for uh, looking at uh, and referencing the previous Scrutiny Management Board's work that they've done. Councillor Stark's much more 
um, involved with that than I was. Um, and, and for the setting out the emerging themes that we've got here. My question really follows on from those last questions around what's what are the KPIs and how are we going to do this? I'm, I'm just very minded of the fact that by the time you get to page 14.24, we're already talking about the first draft of the, the strategy having been written, um, but not circulated to SMB at this, as this is public report and open consultation with staff when the first draft has not yet commenced. So I'm feeling, whilst this has been useful, some of me is feeling this is a little bit frustration, like I've been treated like a, a focus group rather than a, a scrutiny committee. So whilst we've been able to look at what has fed into where you've got now, we're still not 100% sure of where you, what it is that you've got um, because we haven't seen it. Um, so when I look at the, uh, uh, the following point, point 25, that talks about the timeline that you're going to go through uh, to, to getting this to go live in April 2024, I wonder whether there is any further scrutiny of this process um, or whether what we've been shown today and fed into is the end of the, uh, the, end of the process for uh, work outside of Cabinet and, um, and the uh, CLT. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Bartlett, for, for your question there. If I can address the point on KPIs, uh, I, I don't think it's appropriate that the, K the individual KPIs are in a strategy. What the strategy does is says we will have KPIs, so things everybody will be held accountable and for what you do, but those KPIs, and I'll defer to, to Tracy, they will be specified in individual contracts and the job descriptions for those individuals to ha specific to their, their, their area. To go on to the the point about the timeline, uh, we are we admit we're we are effectively six weeks late because uh, of course we w we would have been with you in September, but we're not, so we are a little bit behind. But the plan is to carry on with that timeline unless scrutiny would like to call us back again. I think that's probably something that the chair would comment on. Um, thank you, but uh, yeah, and I totally accept what you say about KPIs. It's just we've all reflected back what you've written in your report and that's why we keep reflecting back the phrase KPI at you. Thank, thank you, committee members. Um, I think as far as whether or not we, we take this again before it uh, gets adopted is something that we need to consider in uh, a work programme item and maybe give uh, officers in the cabinet um, a bit more time to uh, to work on this and get it into a state that they're um, they're able to share um, for for that consideration to take place. Um, thank you very much for questions that you've asked on this. I'm I've not picked up any formal recommendations, but there've been a lot of comments um, that have been made, um, and I hope that officers and the cabinet member will be able to. Um, take those into consideration in the work that you're continuing with. Um, and we uh, look forward to um, seeing a, a, a document when it's, uh, it's ready for, for sharing. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I think we move on to the next agenda item, which is um, delivery plan 2023-24 and 2024-28 county plan development. Um, do we have any um, input or presentation on this uh, before we move to questions? So would you like to do a quick introduction to the, uh, to the topic, please, uh, Chair? So I'd like to thank uh, the Scrutiny Management Board for including the delivery plan 23-24 and county plan development 24-28 on, on the work plan and the agenda. The delivery plan is with the papers along with the Cabinet report where it will be presented to Cabinet on Thursday. As you are aware, the Council has produced a delivery plan over the last two years which sets out how its strategic ambitions will be achieved for that year. This delivery plan is derived from the County Plan of 2024 which together with the medium term financial strategy provides the overarching framework within which decisions are taken 
and resources are allocated in order to meet the ambitions of that plan. The plan provides the key deliverables for the financial year to be achieved in order to meet the ambitions of the county plan. The existing county plan was approved by full council on the 14th of February 2020 and sets out the key strategic ambitions for the county, measures of success and deliverables as developed by the previous administration. Following the election in May and the change of administration, the new cabinet reviewed the current county plan and deliverables. And as part of this review, a process was undertaken to consider whether they should continue to meet the expected outcomes and where appropriate, we have included some new deliverables to meet the county plan's aims and objectives. The delivery plan for 23-24, in it, the report identifies the key programmes of work that this administration will progress through 2023-23-4 to under the three ambitions of the current county plan, namely economy, community and environment. Each of the projects and deliverables contributes to one or more of these objectives as set out in the county plan. This delivery plan will form the basis of performance reporting into the corporate leadership team on a monthly basis and to the cabinet on a quarterly basis alongside financial and risk reporting. Many of the previous objectives have been carried forward but the following objectives will be continued to be monitored within the operational services. That is delivering schools investment program which, subjects, which supports objective CO1 the school improvement to support young people to learn, which supports objective CO1 again. Management of the council's assets to maximise their use, again supporting objective CO0. Deliver broadband coverage via FastAsure while addressing the barriers for people going online, which supports objective EC4. And finally support the tourism and cultural sector across the county, supporting objective EC5. The new county plan for the next four period, the next four year period is in development and will reflect the aims and ambitions of the council. It will focus on improving the county's infrastructure, protecting the environment and putting the needs of our residents first. And this will enable us to deliver the delivery plan for 2024-25 in early 24 with both documents being presented to full council in February. As part of the development, we'd like SMB to consider a small working group to shape and engage with the county plan. The timelines are relatively short, but engagement is very important, we feel, for the future development. And in conclusion, I'd like to invite the SMB to discuss the delivery plan and its recommendations. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Cabinet Member. Um, and uh, I think I'd like to start off um, by saying that um, this agenda item <coughs> was scheduled in our work programme for today with the expectation that the county plan for 2024 to 28 would be at a point in its development when it would be ready for some policy shaping scrutiny um, especially since as the report before us does state um, the plan provides the, the strategic policy framework within which the budget uh, for next year is developed as the first full year of its delivery However, as we can see from the documents today, the county plan is not in a fit state to come to us. And as indicated by the timeline that is given in the report, um, is due to go on a very challenging development path through to its proposed presentation to scrutiny in early January. Um, then Cabinet and on to Council alongside the other papers for the budget for 2024-25. So, given all that we have is this timetable, um, perhaps I could start by asking a cabinet member how you envisage the socialisation of the plan, as you term it, with scrutiny committees to take place between the 4th and the 14th of December, and how, within the rules of governance, you are expecting to receive scrutiny feedback on the proposed plan. I accept fully, Chair, that it, it's a challenging timeline, uh, but we are dealing with a lot of issues as we go through, and uh, and this is the timeline that we, we have. It's uh, We are where we are, I have to say, uh, and we, we have engaged. We have, uh, we have had a number of uh, discussions, 
uh, our work on, deli on, the, uh, on the county plan has commenced a, pe a significant period ago, but it's, it's a case of how much time do we have to do the work in place. Um, we are, but what we do want to do is we do not wish to do it in isolation. We wish to embrace, as, as, as you know, in, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, in a uh, open and transparent manner that you are given the opportunity to, uh, all stakeholders that we wish to engage with, have the opportunity to influence that county plan. Uh, and that's why we are engaging with a number of uh, users. Uh, just to say a few things, so. Yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so um, during that time period, obviously, we'll look to schedule in if, if the agreement is for Scruton Management Board to be part of that process. We do also look to do some engagement with um, residents through impact as well, um, and uh, and obviously all members as well. We will, uh, within the timescales, obviously, all member briefing um, as well within that. Yeah, so I can see what's said in the um, in terms of the timetable um, in the published report, and thank you for the offer to share your pain. Um, I think it does seem to be a very challenging um, time frame that you're setting out there, and given that this is a strategic framework for policy development for the next four years. Um, for this county. Um, I've got a few questions here. So when, when is the public consultation proposed to commence and what is the process by which the public will be engaged on this important subject? How is the consultation proposed to be undertaken with hard to reach groups to meet our statutory requirement in terms of engagement um, uh, and uh, our equalities duties? And how does the cabinet member justify the delay in the, de the development of this important strategic document and the fractional amount of time he proposes to give to enable public engagement? Firstly, can I ask uh, Amy to, to address those first bits and I'll pick up the, the final piece. Yes, of course. So we are working very closely with Impact, who is our consultancy organisation, who's doing the budget consultation, and which is kicking off um, this week. We plan to undertake the public consultation in the next um, couple of weeks. The intention is that we will be doing qualitative working groups um, with a number of um, sectors, such as the business sector, um, through community partnership, through parish councils, um, to look at um, some of the themes that we're working through and some of the um, and some of those identified priority areas as well to get those that feedback into into the document. In terms of hard to reach groups, obviously we'll work through um, work through that in terms of with things like the community partnership, community groups, um, and parish council ta and town councils. Um, also, notwithstanding, obviously, just very recently, um, public consultation was undertaken for the health and wellbeing strategy. So, obviously, we do look at other strategic documents that have had um, recent engagement as well, um, and uh, so how that can sort of feed into what people were saying to us as part of other previous consultations um, as well. So, pick up on your, your final point. We, as Cabinet, we have started our discussions back in the summer. Uh, but other priorities have taken taken apart, and uh, I, I can only apologise for our time management. But we are uh, we are now very focused on delivering this. In fact, l last week's ca uh, pre cabinet, I had a conversation reminded all my cabinet colleagues that we are on a on a railroad, and it's uh, we have a very tight timeline, and it, this is our our priority number one priority. Number one priority. You sure? Okay, well, you're on record with that. Um, I, I, would, I, would well, I would say, Councillor, that it, the reason it's our number one priority is that it's the, it's the, the top level strategy that, in, that drives everything else, and therefore that's why I'm saying it is, and I reminded everybody of the amount of work that will be required to pull this together. Oh, thank you, Cabinet Member. Um, could, I, could I try and offer you a, a bit of a lifeline um, with a recommendation that Cabinet consider rescheduling the governance process for the county plan to enable a level of meaningful consultation to take place with the public and through scrutiny, and that the target date for the plan to go to full council be revised to become the 8th <coughs> of March 2024, when the council is due to set the council tax. And the, the reason that I, I offer
for this recommendation is because clearly you will be developing this plan alongside the medium term financial strategy and uh, the budget and those documents will therefore be cognizant of the developing county plan but it just gives you a little bit more time but within to, to publish yet within the uh, the financial year envelope um, just to you know release the pressure a little bit on what it is you're trying to do here um, just to give you the opportunity maybe to have that that slightly um, more robust consultation process be undertaken outside and also uh, with members and through the scrutiny process well thank you much chair that's uh, that's that's very kind and uh, and I'll, i will willingly uh, uh, take your uh, uh, your kind offer uh, the one thing i would also add to the the list of documents you mentioned is obviously the delivery plan as well will be part of that so yes we admit that it's uh, there is a lot of work uh, but I refer back to our previous point about inspirational leadership. Uh, the Cabinet are aware very clearly uh, through the leader that we are required to deliver this for the good and benefit of the people of Herefordshire, and we will deliver. But that extra month you give us is, uh, is very vital, and, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, uh, we would like to go on record as uh, accepting that, please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think you know, there's nothing much more to be said about the county plan element of this, but I'd like to sort of o open up the... Um, uh, questioning on the delivery plan um, element of this agenda item. Um, so uh, open up to um, committee members on, on that item. Anybody like to indicate? Councillor Stark, your first out the starting gate. Then Not Councillor surprisingly, Chase. it's me, yes. Um, it's a problem, this, because we're three quarters away almost through 23-24. I mean, this is the first time we've really seen the delivery plan for 23-24. I understand all the political uh, constraints caused by the election and everything else, but surely, Councillor Stoddart, there must be a huge risk to this plan being delivered within the next four or five months when it would have been obviously set for the whole year. Um, is there anything that we should be concerned about as a committee in terms of this plan not being delivered because of Tight, this the tight timeline you've got in front of you. What I would like to do is uh, call on Amy because you can uh, give us some record of some of the things that we have achieved through the list. I think you know it's a good point you make. I think what some of the um, and many of the um, areas that we do the deliverables that we put in there are just continuation of what's been in the, within within the um, within the existing delivery plan anyway. You know things like obviously the waste strategy and the river quality. Those are things big ticket items that have continued through. To be honest, and the majority of the things have kind of just continued through. So yes, you know it is now mo November. And you quite rightly say this plan is now up to the end of March twenty four, um, but. Uh, and many of these things in the plan are actually things that are already being delivered, such as things like the children's improvement plan, etc. So it, what this plan tries to do is just try to bring all that together in terms of what will be achieved. What we've also done as part of the process is corporate directors, directors, service directors have worked with their key cabinet members to say actually what um, what are we going to what are we going to continue recognizing the timescales within within what we what we need to do to achieve. And obviously what we will do as part of the county plan process, which we are doing, have been for some months, a couple of months now, is reviewing what's been delivered over the last four years, as well as, you know, what's been delivered on a year by year basis, and then reviewing that to see actually what again what we're going to be looking to take forward into the next to the next county plan. Okay, um, on that basis, because um, the chair yeah. knows in previous email exchanges, I was concerned that I couldn't see what was new in this <laughs> plan council stored up. It's back to my point about the capital programme as well. I would have preferred a narrative that showed the transition from where we were to where we are now and the, the additional new objectives that you are bringing into actually then allow us as a scrutiny committee to have a clearer focus on those new ones to see what we thought about them and whether we felt they were the right priorities or not. So that is one of the issues. And it's not just with this particular plan. I think that's a problem we've got with other programmes that are sitting before us, that you really do need to try and help, particularly those of us who were in the previous administration, who then, only as, as recent as spring, were signing up to various plans. 
where we've got to now from there and that sort of narrative then helps us to see what you've changed and why you've changed it and whether we then accept that those priorities are the right ones for the council. So I'm a bit at a loss here, Chair, as to how to take this forward, as I said in my email to you, because I quite agree with, with, with what Amy said. There's a lot in here that is just continuation, but it's not that clear what is and what isn't. And I would have thought that would have been helpful for the committee if we'd actually had that drawn to our attention more. Thank you. Yes, th thank you, Councillor Stark. I mean, uh, look, <coughs> I, I looked back at the the previous delivery plan in terms of how it was structured, and it was set out very clearly against the um, the objectives in the county plan, saying what had already been achieved and what was planned to be delivered for the coming 12 months. And that doesn't seem to be a format that has been continued with this plan to identify, you know, and recognise what's already been achieved and what is what is planned for this financial year that we're that we're in. Um, you know, I I don't see it so much as a as a risk. Um, uh, uh, in, in terms of delivery, councillor Stark, because you know it's almost an exam question that's written for you. In that, you know, you, you know what you've done already, um, and you know what you're likely to be able to do um, looking forward three or four months, which is all you're needing to do with with this as a plan. So, um, <laughs> it's it's a nicer position to be in than be writing a delivery plan for the front end of the year, but you know, you'll have that to look forward next year. Um, it, it is unfortunate, I think, particularly seeing as the, um, the feedback was provided in the um, uh, political group consultation that was undertaken on, on this, saying it's important to see what's new, uh, what you're adding in, um, and also what you're choosing not to continue with in this final year of, of the county plan. And that's kind of obscured in the way that, that the delivery plan is laid out at the moment, which I think is unfortunate. And in terms of transparency, it would be helpful if you were explicit about that. I mean, it's not as if there are some things that we can't imagine you would be having on that list as things you're not pursuing with vigour and pace. Um, however, actually to set it out as a, you know, as a document for the public record, I think would would be appropriate. Um, Councillor Chowns. Can I, can I just respond to your comment there, uh, Chair, if that's possible? So I take it, Philip from the chin, uh, that we should have presented not the actual delivery plan, but in the report, perhaps picking up on Councillor Stark's point, make it a little bit clearer in the front. So I, I apologise for that, and uh, and I will learn from that one. So uh, please take my apologies. Councillor Chowns. Thanks. Um, several of my points actually pick up on the same themes. Um, and I'm not quite clear, Councillor Stoddart, where you've just said that you will now reframe the delivery plan in the same way as the previous one. I'll go through my, I've got four specific requests. So, I mean, number one is please number and letter items for ease of reference. You know, any report that's got 100 bullet points literally in it has to have them numbered so we can all identify the thing that we're talking about. Um, but... More specifically, I too actually went back and looked at the previous delivery plan and it sets out, you know, in the first column, what the uh, element of the county plan is. So the overall objective we're working towards, it summarises briefly what's been done so far and then sets out again with reference numbers, what is going to be done in the, the next period. And as a cabinet member, I, I insisted on that happening and then insisted on it being used for reporting back because we need to be checking every quarter in our performance reporting that we are doing what we said we were going to do at the start of the year. I 
recognise that we're actually almost all the way through the year now anyway, but the, the principle of making sure that overarching s strategic plans are related to the plan for what you're going to do each year, which is the delivery plan, and then reporting back on that. I think it really ought to be embedded, and it's it's a bit sad, really, that it's it seems it, it's gone, you know, and we're back to, in the draft that we've been given today, a sort of... A, a, a vague list of things without any clarity about which parts of the county plan they refer to, without any clarity about how they relate to things that have previously been done. So the specific request is, could it please be presented in the same format as the previous one? Because that just, it really aids legibility, not just for councillors, but any member of the public who takes any interest in these things. And, and I think it's part of our commitment to transparency. So thank you. That was my second thing. My third point is, you know, is it possible, please, to be more specific? Again, looking back at the previous delivery plan, the one that was the last one when I was in administration, you know, we, we had numbers attached to things that we said that we were going to do. Whereas in this one, it says um, really, really very vague things. I think there's something there about, um, you know, support households with energy efficiency as one of the sort of key objectives for this year. That's really very vague. And considering that we're now you know, two thirds, three quarters of the way through the year, <laughs> we could probably write some, you could write some numbers in there that you're guaranteed that you'll be able to achieve with a nice big green tick at the end of the year, because you know how you're doing. So again, <coughs> a bit more kind of oomph and clarity around it, I think would be very helpful. And then the fourth thing is I did spot one or two things that had, in my view, already been achieved before the 1st of April, 2023. And I was surprised to see them in there as things to be done during the current year, including the establishment of the Economy and Place Board and the establishment of the Skills Forum, which both of which I established as a cabinet member or was very involved in establishing. So can we just make sure that we're not, so, and indeed, you know, the climate, uh, the, the resilience um, report, again, that was actually commissioned under the auspices of the Climate Reserve projects. You know, it, it's okay, it's going to be delivered this year, great, but the rationale for inclusion of some things there was really not clear. So if those four things could be addressed, I'd be uh, really grateful. A um, couple of minor presentational points. The text on the penultimate page is a repeat of text in the beginning. Maybe that's because you just really want to hammer that home as an administration, and that's your right. Um, and the map on the back is not centred. It's not centred on Hereford. It's, it's, it really sort of focuses on the southwest corner of the county, which is great, but, you know, the county is bigger, so it, it feels wonky, essentially. Maybe that could be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin Chance. Uh, the last one we want is a, is a wonky Herefordshire, so uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I, again, uh, I'll take those firmly and squarely on the, on the chin, uh, and uh, we'll uh, I'll look to address them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Baker and then Councillor Fagan. Thank you, Chair. Just a matter of clarity, really, um, not having seen these plans before, but should not the delivery plan for 23-24 have been agreed and presented last year? And should the county plan for 24 and beyond, should that not have been agreed and delivered last year? Just a point. So, Councillor, the, uh, th this is the, the final delivery plan period of the previous administration's county plan. So the county plan is a four-year document, and the delivery plan is how you wish, what you wish and how you wish to do it for that one year ahead. So you're correct. This, this, this document, as, uh, as the chair alluded to, it's November, we're delivering it. Uh, it should have been delivered in uh, what we will be doing for the new county plan is to, as we've just uh, alluded to, we'll be doing it, releasing for approval in March, which will give the 2024-2025 delivery plan. So yes, you're co you are correct. We are, we are right. And Councillor Baker, on, on that point, are, as the Cabinet member responsible during the um, during what should have been the development period of the the delivery plan, although we were in Perda, I was assured by officers that the delivery plan was in the process of being drafted in order to be in a solid 
final draft stage for the next administration, which we hoped at the time would be us. <laughs> Again, um, you know, it was not in our interests to delay on on that. Um, but I think, you know, what we were, you know, it didn't turn out that way. Let's just leave. Let's just leave it like that. So, um, you know, this is this is where we find ourselves. Councillor Fagan. Yeah, th uh, thank you. I, I, I don't necessarily want to repeat everything that either you or Councillor Chans have said, but um, looking looking at the delivery plan and uh, ha having represented uh, the, the Greens at Cabinet um, during the last administration, I almost didn't recognise what what was actually being presented here because I'm very used to the specifics, uh, which was extremely helpful, looking at that every quarter, looking at the specifics, looking at the RAG rating, so we could see, actually, so we knew ourselves as a council what was working, what wasn't working, what we needed to step up on. So I, I think that the points that have been made are actually particularly important. And I think, you, you know, just looking at the... Um, the issues around uh, ch children's uh, deliverables for um, the for for children, so so they they come under. Uh, sorry, I just get back onto onto the page here. So they're the community ambition, um, and it it almost looks like a sort of wish list on there rather than actually a set of objectives that we set ourselves. So we, looking at this, you can't actually tell how you know, how far we've actually moved forward or, or not on this. So I think it is it is really, really important because these, particularly these issues around the improvement of children's services. Now, I know that we've got our improvement plan, but that is not a public document. So it's, it's not possible for the public to look at that and say, okay, well, we, we said we were going to further develop and embed our restorative practice and model focused on working with families. We don't actually know where we've got to on that unless you sit on the improvement board. So I, th I think, and, and I could go through the whole list, uh, you know, but I, and I don't want to labour the point, but I think it's just particularly useful for us as a council, as elected members, to be able to look at ourselves and say, actually, are we achieving on these ambitions or, or are we not? And if we're not, what what's going wrong? So uh, there was just that point. And... Uh, I, again, y y you know, I, I realise that the county plan hasn't uh, the, the state that the county plan's in, but um, I sort of just the, the, on the page that says uh, future planning and delivery, and the plan will focus on improving county's infrastructure, uh, protect environment, putting needs of our residents first. We find those are obviously the, the themes of community environment and economy. But it's, it, we want economic growth, better paid jobs, improved air quality, and a council that will thrive and demonstrate great value for money. We, we need to do some work on that because the children's, the situation with children's services has got to be a priority. That our work with families has got to be a priority with that. The restoration of the River Y is, has, is absolutely key to, to all of that. So I, I hear what you say that, you know, there's work to be done. Um, but I, I just sort of looking at that set, set those couple of sentences and realize where the kind of huge gaps are. Now, I'm not going to go through the, the, the list of um, sort of delivery items that I, I flagged up and particularly thinking about children's because I think I've made the point about it. Th th thank you, Councillor. What I can do is to address uh, Councillor Chowns, the Chair and yourself, Councillor Vegan. Uh, the when you see the county plan and the delivery plan next year, uh, we, the formatting and the layout uh, will address all those issues. So there will be everything will be numbered, listed. Uh, there were uh, a rag against it. Whether or not I've seen previously where we have percentages on achievement, sometimes it can be out of date since it's produced. I'm not sure about that, but we'll certainly look to provide for the council all 53 members a report that you can actually then uh, would be, I hope, more valuable to you. Okay, thank, thank you for that assurance, um, Cabinet Member. Um, I think, 
I, I looked at this um, and uh, a bit like Councillor Fagan, I think, sort of started to, to think about what I wasn't seeing. Um, and for me, one of the striking um, omissions, if you like, was how little um, mention there is in the report that we've had presented to us here um, on environment deliverables. Um, there's, there's no mention of the, the city master plan um, or reducing the council's own carbon footprint. Um, there's no mention of the phosphate commission. Um, there is mention of the you know failed and somewhat discredited talking shop that has been the nutrient management board. I'm sorry to say, Councillor Swinglehurst, you know it it has not been having its run seal moment for a long time, and I know that it's a struggle that you have, you know, you have been wrestling with. Um, but you know. I worry that this is indicative of, you know, a broader lack of interest in, you know, that whole environment theme um, that will be very worrying for the public to see if, you know, what is presented in this report is representative of your priorities. So progress on, for example, the, the Phosphate Commission. Um, progress on, on what was happening there should have come back to Cabinet in July um, and is now more than three months out of date. Um, I don't know how many times the Phosphate Commission members have met um, since in the eight months since you've been in, in charge um, or what's happened to the £400,000 that was allocated in the budget to progress this work. Um, but those are very clearly things that you could have put in as deliverables here because they're already sort of signed up to as being things that are going on. Now, given the level of public concern about this issue and the game of musical chairs that's going on at ministerial level at the moment in um, sections of government that have uh, partial responsibility for the river and its condition. Um, surely it's important that um, this administration makes every effort to maintain the momentum that's been developed over the last two years by continuing to push this agenda at a local level. Um, also, I don't see any mention of the, um, the work that has been ongoing to mitigate the impact of the moratorium on development in the lug catchment. Um, no mention of intended progress in delivering more wetlands to take phosphate out of our stressed river system and to create headroom to enable development to come forward in, the, in this development blighted area of the county, which is so important to local businesses that rely on the, um, the house building sector. Um, and again, it's, that's a striking example of an omission from this is a delivery plan, which, you know, seems to be, you know, you're taking a real sort of bead on your own big toes and trying to shake them off. Um, you know, examples of, you know, what's not there. Um, I can guess that there's probably very low appetite for going round the boy on this, given that this is slated on the agenda for um, Cabinet later this week. Um, and I hear what you say in terms of your promises that we're going to do a lot better when it comes to the county plan and the first year's delivery plan for that um, as a strategic framework. But given that this is supposed to be the last delivery year of the current county plan. Um, could I propose a recommendation that you plan to have a closure report produced for the, the existing county plan where you wrap up what has been achieved over the four years of that plan and maybe 
try and plug some of the gaps that exist in the way that this delivery plan is representing your first year in office? Sure, thank you. I'll, uh, yes, uh, that, that, that will be a useful document we can put together. Uh, I would also mention that it's not eight months, it's six. And uh, what I would like to do is just defer across to my cabinet colleague who will uh, explain much just further I'd, on. I'll chip in a little bit, if I may, uh, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think for, for me, the, 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 the issue here, and it's something that I've heard around the room, is, is one of you know setting the level of detail for this uh, version of the delivery plan. And if there's not enough detail in there, and I, I get that, but then it's sort of hard to know where do, where do we stop, where do we begin, you know, is this only till March? Um, as far as the points you're making around um, the importance of the environment, uh, and specifically the River Y, and then also the associated uh, issue with, uh, with, with delivery of, uh, of housing um, that held up by the so-called moratorium. Um, that, that is absolutely, you know, central to uh, what, we're, what we're doing, you know, for, for a number of very obvious reasons. Um, the, the Luston Wetland is uh, up, running, performing, delivering credits, uh, and Tarrington and Titley uh, have been secured and will progress and we've got negotiations on a fourth site um, so we you know we're, 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 we're moving on that uh, you're right about the challenges of what might be going on elsewhere and how that impacts the the, the speed and confidence with which we can take decisions um, the cabinet commission um, had got to a place with a, a report and recommendation um, and, and as you correctly uh, say, the Cabinet Commission is also about building relationships and, and partnering with our neighbouring authorities um, and also, you know, having constructive relationship with the statutory agencies. The uh, recommendation that came from the Cabinet Commission in the end was not supported um, <coughs> a, in a sufficient way for it to progress and indeed the Cabinet Commission itself now has decided to pop that on the back burner, it having, as it were, served the purpose. Um, the Nutrient Management Board has gone through a, a period of navel-gazing um, and, and hopefully has come out of that uh, a fitter uh, creature to, to do the job that it's supposed to be doing, although that job is now, as it were, I think with, with greater clarity, split between the Nutrient Management Board and the uh, Strategic Officers Group, which will be uh, and always has been responsible for the plan. Um, I think it makes more sense to actually split those two organisations so you can see where delivery should sit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of, I, I wish we had, you know, if we had more detail, I think you'd all be more comforted, but it will come forward with the uh, with the county plan. So, so, so this, this idea of saying this is where we've got to with everything, because you're right, you, we, we need to know that. Well, I think this is a missed opportunity, for, given that we're three quarters of the way through the year, for you to have, you know, sort of had an easy, had an easy goal, an open goal, really, that you seem to have missed um, kicking a ball into uh, with, with, with this, um, and I don't quite understand why. Um, but uh, I think it is concerning if you, if the document is missing some of these things that you say are absolutely central to the work that you're doing, that this is a delivery plan is not recognising that, um, particularly given the level of public concern that there is over things like the development moratorium on the business side of things and, you know, for the public on the, the, the state of the river. And if, as you say, you're now putting some of that work on the back burner and you're not even saying what you're putting in its place in order to give public confidence that momentum is being maintained. I think that's a serious omission. I'm um, just just in order to uh, to clarify that what's put on being put on the back burner is the plan that came forward from the cabinet commission, and that has been at the request of the cabinet <laughs> commission itself. That plan having not been supported entirely by the last administration who commissioned it and is not supported by the statutory agencies and not supported by the uh, various groups that, that are uh, concerned about the environment in Herefordshire. 
We were heading back into, uh, you know, river protection zone territory. If you haven't got anything that you're bringing forward, which is some sort of a voluntary scheme, that the the the, the plan will sit with the with the statutory agencies, and that's where the plan has to be because that's the, they're the agencies that have the authority to bring that forward, and the. Um, this, the, the idea that came forward um, in terms of the phosphate trading scheme or the pool scheme was just not supported. So, you know, we may at some point be able to go back to it, but, you know, you have to move with your partners and other stakeholders, I'm afraid. And put it in your delivery plan. Chair, picking up on your your final point before uh, uh, my colleague, colleague engaged with you. So the a closure report idea, I think, is uh, is a useful idea, and we'll look to put that in place to, to as you say, to close this four-year period, and we'll get that in, in to you prior to March. Well, I don't think we'd have a problem with it being after March, seeing as uh, you've actually got to put the financial year to bed. Um, Councillor Stark. We're focusing on the plan, but what worries me is the plan delivers the allocation resources, Chair. And I'm very unclear still about what's changed, the level to which it's changed, how that might have impacted on the resource allocation in the, in, in the county in terms of any change in focus of some of the teams that are working in any of the directorates, particularly in economy and environment. So if we, if we are going to have clarity in this, then it's clear we ought to have the resource implications of this as well, where the changes have been made. And I don't see that, Chair. I don't see that anywhere. And that's, that's a worry because we can't really scrutinise the plan without knowing exactly what's happening with the resources underneath because that's where the uh, funding implications come from and where the pressures will come from for next year's revenue budget deliberations as well. So I don't know where we go with this. I mean, I've looked at what we've been asked to do, which is to see whether we've got any recommendations and emerging themes, but I'm really at a loss, Chair, as to what we do with this as a scrutiny committee. Maybe I'm being a bit pessimistic, but, but I don't... For once, I'm at a loss for words. Amy, would you like to say something? Yes, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just in terms of that, obviously, um, um, it, and as, a, as it's sort of highlighted in the report, all the all the projects and all the deliverables are in here. Obviously, they're all but standalone projects, so they have their own budget allocated, and that's actually that's then then within the revenue budget of the overall, um, you know, the council. And anything that needs to change will be will be by a project by project basis, based on then what the revenue budget is for those allocated services or or projects. And the idea then going forward in terms of the county plan of aligning it to the um, of sort of the February um, full council was to actually make sure that obviously it does align them back into the revenue budget and the uh, and the capital budget as well. So it does kind of so it does all kind of connect back to back together. Um, but I mean, uh, in terms of previous delivery plans, there hasn't been any <coughs> direct resources allocated back into delivery plans. This is about you know what's going to be delivered within that within the within to meet those county plans objectives. Um, within the budget that's already been allocated and within the council's resources. But we, uh, we, we have an issue with pressures on the revenue budget, comes of sort of And what I was trying to get at is, has, has the executive got a clear view as to what the change in priorities in this plan will have in the underlying revenue budget? Or as you say, saying, Amy, that we <coughs> won't know until the actual individual business cases have been stacked up and added together? No, I think what I'm saying is, um, obviously, the, the, the individual projects have their own allocated budgets, and which was in their own revenue budget. And many, like I've said before, many of these are continuation anyway of projects that have continued forward from previous, um, previous delivery plans. Um, so, that, and, and they do, they are within their own sort of budgets and allocated budgets. Anything then that needs to change or dis alternative decisions need to be made, so added or removed from the capital program. Obviously, there's a governance process that they need to go through on their own individual individual basis and that's part of the uh, the ongoing uh, q2 report we're looking at at the minute uh, and then obviously tied to as you alluded to councillor stark 
the delivery plan and uh, and the accounting plan for next uh, for the next four year period will then be linked then through to next year's revenue and the MTFS. That, thank you for that. And I think, Councillor Stoddart, one, one of the things that you know, I'd like to share with you is quite how difficult we found it in administration to actually nail down what it is that you know officers service areas were prepared to say was actually going to be delivered and you know if you can resist the sort of enthusiasm that we see from the you know what is in this delivery plan for continuing to dot 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 um, or carrying on dot 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 um, that would be good because you know the message that we tried very hard to develop with our officers in the service areas was you know yes you might be aiming at a point on the horizon that's going to take a number of years to get there but there are discrete steps along that journey that you can actually <coughs> identify as milestones delivered. We will achieve this. We will put a business case together. We will obtain grant funding for. We will, on the journey towards whatever. And that's why the county plan <coughs> and the delivery plan was structured to have some objectives, those horizon points, that then had a number of things that came together on that journey towards that horizon point. And I think having some real concrete in-year deliverables that you can set against the budgets that service areas have enable you as an administration to have confidence that the money that is being spent day by day by day in you know existing is actually resulting in things being achieved now you know you have a blank sheet of paper in terms of what it is you want to say is going to be achieved write on it thank you chair uh it's as you say, it's it's the linkage of all the pieces together uh, that it's as as you admit it's it's very challenging. Uh, and I I'll be quite frank, six months in, it's a uh, it's a new day, <coughs> new school day every half day, not even a day, every half day. Um, but what I can assure you and your committee that we are committed to one hundred percent to delivering for the county, and all of our efforts will be aligned to deliver that. And as I say, we'll look to get your closure report for this to to enable you to see that in the format that you would like to see it. And that will be the format then that we'll go forward with our delivery plan for next year. OK, thank you. Well, you've missed the opportunity to say what you three quarters delivered this year, um, which is a shame for you. <laughs> um, we look forward to a closure report. Um, on the county plan and what it is you're going to bring forward as the uh, the county plan for the for the coming four years. Do I have any more questions from uh, Councillor Thomas? I didn't realise a man of my physical size was so invisible. I've had my hand up many times. Um, can do we have to have the whole plan in front of us? Can we not have sections of it? so that we can do our work? Is that not possible? Are we talking county plan or delivery plan? Well, both if necessary, but certainly the, what we need to this urgent piece, which our chairman is, is on the way, can we not have parts of it and you completed? There must be pieces already completed. So can we not have that? We can scrutinize that, go back, come back to you? Is that not possible? It seems to me to be A bit of a, a strange arrangement, and I'm not, I'm not criticising 
this committee or, or the cabinet. I just think it's the whole thing. There's a huge amount of effort going into writing all this. Reports, appraisals, and futuristic uh, want, uh, want, uh, want list. It's, it's all, we're taking a huge amount of staff to be able to do all this. Um, uh, at the end of the day, where does it actually get us? Are we any better? Down? Are they delivering any better service? Uh, I would have to be, you know, to, been to in business as long as I have. I'd have to doubt that this business model really works. But <laughs> you're questioning the whole fundamental concept of the the county plan. Except, as I say, the the, the county plan is the top level document that effectively from that. It has a. It will have this cabinet's or this council's four-year plan of what we wish to do across a, the whole swathe of the county, including economy, environment, and so on and so forth. They will be more high-level approach, and then the delivery plan will then deliver you the very clear bits to be measured at the end of that year to be done, because as Councillor Stark alluded to, that then ties then through into the revenue budget which shows how we can achieve with the resources to achieve it and also then back into the capital programme, which gives you the capital bits to do that work. So it's, it's not meaningless. It's, in, it's, it's a very important set of documents that enable us to take the whole, the, 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 the whole um, aspiration forward. I hope I didn't use the word meaningless. I certainly didn't mean to. I don't think I did. No, it, uh, uh, but you haven't actually answered my question. Can we have part of it to scrutinise while well, you carry on writing the remainder of it? So that do we have to have the whole plan in front of us? <laughs> Again, I'm not 100% sure. What well, you're, I thought what that was a straightforward question. Can we have part of this plan that we need to scrutinise? Can we have the bits that are completed? Or as you complete them, can we have them to scrutinise? Well, you carry on scrutinising the remainder of it. I, I don't see... It, it sounds to me very complicated in that we have to have the whole plan in front of us and then go forward. Can we not have parts of that plan that are completed? They must be completed. We can provide you with a written report which will show you the, uh, the, the, the items that have been completed to date, can I? Form part. I mean, part of the closure report that's already been alluded to today is absolutely something we will be de um, delivering as part of the new county plan. Obviously, what sits behind this is quite a lot of um, performance monitoring, delivery monitoring, um, project monitoring um, that we we can look at. So, uh, so yes, we we can share you know that information or at least provide um, some of that information, um, and that might be whether it's part of this or whether it's actually part of the county planning that we do uh, in the next sort of couple of weeks, we can sort of um, merge it in into that, which is part of that closure report. Um. Rather than having two separate sort of, you know, we, you know we're, the, we're, that, we're this close to developing the county plan and pulling, pulling that closure report together that we could sort of just align all that uh, at the same time. I don't know. Th it, it sounds great, Amy, and I, I look forward to it. Um, I, I think, you know, taking the points that Councillor Chowns was making about having some, um, some, you know, numbers in there, um, could I suggest that you use the SMART acronym and that we actually <coughs> have specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time-bound identified deliverables as part of that, the first delivery plan for the county plan. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got two, uh, Councillor Bartlett, are you wanting to, to come in on this? Oh, sorry, Bart, you know, I did lose other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that might help to um, make sure that what we've got uh, our actual sort of deliverable milestones within the year and we can move away from things that just continue to continue. Do I have committee members signalling or do I go to 
Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Bartlett. Thank you, Chair. And um, <coughs> thank you for the inputs from both sides. Um, and again, it, it for me, uh, following on from what Councillor Stark said, it's, you know, how did we spend, what did we do and how did we spend our money doing it? And um, in terms of what I've always seen before, um, certainly from last year as well, is, you know, that, that some of it's just very simple about informatics. We did this amount of this, we did that amount of that. Um, because uh, without understanding what we've done, yeah, we can't understand what hasn't been done, nor can we understand what is in here to be delivered that was never in here before. And you can't have a delivery plan of things that didn't exist when you started out. It's not rocket science. Um, but hopefully, now that we've agreed that we're going to have some kind of uh, plan to, or some kind of report to wrap up, um, it may become clearer because it's very difficult to see how much how much more time we can spend on the delivery plan that needs to be addressed and put to bed um, whilst we're still struggling to understand the forthcoming county plan at the same time so yeah I would so I would definitely recommend trying to put some at least simple informatics in there and to be honest as well it's it's actually it beholden to us to recognize the amount of work that our officers have done over the year you know because they have been working their socks off and they do need to be um, recognized in some way that they actually have been doing some good work thank you Councilor Bart, thank you very much and uh, and I on behalf of the cabinet would like to uh, carry on your point to all of our council officers and all of our employees for the hard work that they do do and you're very val your point is very valid that in itself actually would then reflect the hard effort that they put in so no your points are valid and uh, I've taken them and I will put that in place do I have any more questions from committee members no okay well the um, the recommendations that that come with this agenda item are that we uh, note the content of this report which um, we have done and you've commented on that um, that we provide any recommendations and I think we've I've put forward two, um, one on shifting the, um, the date for the, uh, the county plan to come to full council and, you know, the governance process behind that, similarly to slide specifically to enable meaningful consultation to take place. And the other one is the closure report on the, uh, uh, the four-year county plan that uh, is, is coming to an end. Um, and then the third recommendation is that we um, convene a task and finish group um, to provide views and recommendations on the, the draft county plan as, as it continues to develop. And I think that aligns quite nicely, Councillor Stoddart, with your, um, your request that there is some <coughs> sort of a working group that um, that walks alongside what you're doing so um, if the committee is supportive of us doing that we'll get a um, uh, some terms of reference um, drafted for for that uh, task and finish group and can committee members consider um, whether you'd like to be involved in that um, and can I uh, get a um, uh, can we take a vote on the two recommendations um, are you generally supportive of, of uh, that those in favour okay great thank you very much okay two recommendations to go with the uh, the feedback councillor Stoddart thank you very much um, and Amy, thank you um, for, uh, for, for walking us through that one. Um, we're on to agenda item nine. Yeah, before, we, before we move on, I'm sorry to butt in. Um, some of the 
the wording in the county plan is not aimed at lay people such as me. Um, it's, it's, they're not clear. Some of the items in this plan are not clear to me as to what they mean. I wondered if someone could go through it and make sure that the that wording uses, there's a thing here, the neglect strategy they talked about, uh, the, the graded care profile, et cetera, et cetera. There's lo lots of little phrases like that that mean nothing to me. How on earth you can clarify that in a report, I don't know. But uh, there's a, there, I'm, I'm sure I don't speak just for myself. There's a lot of things in here that I frankly don't follow. Is this in the delivery plan, Councillor Baker? Sorry, it's, <coughs> the, it's the county plan. Um, it's the objectives in this coloured bit on the uh, on the report. But, we um, haven't got the county plan in front of us. We've got the delivery plan. Well, I just thought, well, they're going to be doing it anyway. Obviously, someone's got to be rewriting this thing. Um, but as I say there's a lot of words in there that, that, that I don't follow. Thank Chair, can I s give uh, Councillor Baker the, my assurance that I'll get the, uh, as Chanto, uh, Councillor Chalmers mentioned earlier, we'll get the lexicon out and uh, we will make sure that we, we write it in the most clear English we can. Thank you. And if there's a glossary of terms that we need to include just to aid with um, understanding, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, and with that, move on to agenda item number nine. Uh, which is uh, fees and charges or fees and income as we've got described here. Um, I must I must say that um, I was I was expecting um, I was expecting more. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the information that we had deferred from um, the meeting that we had a fortnight ago, uh, where we took a, um, a bit of a teaching on work that had been previously undertaken by PricewaterhouseCoopers um, for us looking at... Um, income generating opportunities and that was really an opportunity for the council uh, for the members of the committee to be um, brought up to date on uh, the background work that's been going on on um, income and um, and charging um, on the understanding that what came to this committee today was the detail that we were advised wasn't able to be provided um, a fortnight ago on the bigger picture as far as income and charging is concerned across the council um, and what we're, what you as an administration are looking at in terms of where um, it's appropriate to try and recover service delivery costs through charging and uh, where you choose not to um, and some of the information that we discussed at the first at the first meeting a fortnight ago on things like um, where car parking charging, for example, is contributing to um, funding in-year service delivery in other areas of the council and how we propose to manage the dynamic of that um, in the coming year to be assured that we don't end up incurring costs that are not matched by the income being generated through um, car parking, etc. We haven't received that, um, and uh, 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 is is there is there a reason for that? Thank you, Chair. Uh, what I would like to just start by saying is uh, uh, to continue to offer my apologies if I'm unable to attend the meeting on the seventh due to other work commitments, where I know you had an initial presentation on the service cost recovery work stream. And my thanks also go out to the officers who attended and provide you with that overview of that work to date. I'd also like to thank the uh, Scrutiny Management Board for their work to date and note that the issues you wanted to explore more detail today. And shortly, uh, officers Ross and uh, Amy on my left will, will cover that in a little bit more detail. By way of introduction, I'd like to make the following 
opening remarks, however, Hereford's Council is facing budgetary pressures driven in part by increasing demand for services but also in response to the wider economic challenges that are being experienced across local government as well as a number of local and national challenges. The Thrive Transformation Programme pulls together existing transformational <coughs> initiatives and plans from across the Council into one overall transformation programme building on ambitious plans to transform the way in which the Council works. The Thrive Transformational Programme is all about improving all aspects of the way in which the Council works and is a fundamental part of our approach to maintaining a sustainable financial budget now and in future years. As part of this, Herefordshire Council have recognised an opportunity to make much greater use of digital technologies to deliver services and improve the efficiency of the Council. The aspiration is to reimagine the way in which we work by maximising the use of technology and by putting the customer, the residents of the county, at the heart of everything that we do. This ambition requires us to look at everything that we do and to fundamentally rethink our approach from strategies and delivery models through to, through to performance management and workforce planning. Service cost recovery is a key aspect of our transformational journey as it focuses on both the cost of delivering services, sorry, uh, on both by ensuring the cost of delivering services is at the minimum of costs, as well as considering the full cost recovery, excuse me, full cost recovery of services where either a charge is applicable or alternate income streams is available. I would now like to invite officers to provide a further update on a number of these issues that you raised at your last meeting, and we're happy to take any questions after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stollard and uh, members. Firstly, uh, just to add to your comments earlier, uh, uh, Chair, just around the, the information that you're expecting today, and as apologies for me, I think there was a, a miscommunication in terms of what was being released ahead of the meeting and what would be presented today. Um, we've got some slides and presentation that we're happy to go through uh, this afternoon, which just brings back many of the questions that you asked at the last meeting, um, and colleagues have got those slides available to, to present to you. Um, and happy to pick up any more questions that you've got at the end of that. Well, I'm, I'm happy to take a presentation in the room, but I mean, part of um, the statutory requirement is that, you know, we have information published, partly so that members of the public and councillors can submit written questions um, ahead of the meeting and so that the committee can actually appraise itself of the the subject matter that we're going to be discussing. So <coughs> we will be reacting in the room to what you present to us here. Um, and it would be helpful if you provided that to our officers so that we can publish that as part of the, the minutes of the meeting at least. Um, but it may be that we need to come back to it further, given that we haven't had the time and the notice to um, to prepare our thoughts. Yep, no, all all, uh, all notes and accepted, uh, Chair. And I think, again, more than happy to come back. What, what we will show as part of the presentation is that many of the aspects we're considering in terms of service cost recovery are part of that developing budget setting. Um, we'll be presenting back to cabinet members in terms of the list of opportunities that we've seen um, that we might present um, as part of increased income, increased opportunities for our fees and charges, and those will then be listed as part of the budget. Which ones we'll take forward and which ones um, cabinet and council will then take decisions on it, it wishes to proceed on. Um, so the, the second, the first slide is just the introduction and the, the, the next slide, I think colleagues can move on. I think that's the, the comments that uh, Councillor Stallart made in his, in, in his opening address. So the, the next slide um, just really brings back to the questions you were asking around the Thrive Programme. If we can move that one on. Um, as Councillor Stallart has mentioned a few times, there was a wider piece of transformation work that the PwC were commissioned to do for the Council. Um, and this starts to then link in with the programme that you've already discussed in terms of Thrive. Um, our new council plan that we're developing and what sort of organisation that we need to be 
and service cost recovery was one of those four aspects of work that uh, we've been looking at. Um, and as you've seen, there is a, a wider transformation program and we're focusing on in terms of what are the key priorities for the council, how will those be delivered and then how will we recover the, the, the different costs of that. Um, the service cost recovery was your, your key focus last time um, and we can go into the details that you've asked a bit more information on that over the covering slides. So in particular, you're asking around the, the opportunities that the, um, the service cost recovery work stream was looking at, um, and there were presented to us a, a long list of opportunities um, for 84 different aspects of service cost recovery. And we touched on last time that there were four that were coming forward as business cases. Um, there were some quick wins that I can talk through in a moment. And then there were some other areas that we were looking at as part of our wider transformation programme in terms of, we talked talk last time around commercial uh, commercialization, um, income generation from different activities, and some areas where actually the proposals just weren't aligned to the new and emerging council priorities that were coming forward. So the, a bit more detail in, in what we've been looking at. Um, so this slide particularly covers the, the work that we're looking at in my own directorate for economy and environment. Um, and as I said last time, these were broken down in terms of um, looking at parking as a whole. Um, and you've asked that question in terms of the, I think last time we, we talked on both how, how do we ensure that the, the income from parking is, is then aligned to the priorities that match that and that's the piece of work that we're, we're doing to make sure we can show that in the budget presentation as well that yeah, the income generated from parking how do we show that that's ring fenced and sort of paid back into the, the cost of delivering and maintaining the, the, the highway network. Um, and within that there are sort of different ones and these are the ones that was, we're just discussing through with the, with the cabinet member in terms of which ones are aligned to the new council plan and which ones are we going to put uh, put down as sort of future opportunities that, that will not come forward at this time. Um, community advertising, again we talked around this one last time and this is where we're going to look particularly around the different assets, whether they're highway assets, whether they're um, buildings and such like or whether they're other things like um, bus stops or litter bins and things that we've seen. There, there's a different work stream looking at, um, this is mainly around sponsorship and advertising and then there's a sort of more commercial aspect around targeting um, key key services that people might want to buy from. So you'll see it, many of you will get it from, uh, if you subscribe to something you might get a, you know, a follow up email to, to join a club or to, to um, some sort of service or activity and we're working with partners such as such as Halo to think about, well, how do we do that sort of upselling of services that they offer and how we can link that back to, to the council plan priorities as well. There's a specific piece of work around the home to school transport project. Um, and as you know, there's sort of two aspects or two or three aspects around this in terms of the policy setting. You know, so there's a big piece of work to make sure that we are providing the right service to the right people in the right areas of the county. And then actually, how do we deliver that in terms of the, the most cost effective and that's going to take a longer piece, a longer while to, to bring that forward. On the right hand side then we've just talked, just talked around some of the sort of quick wins and, and uh, areas that we've looked at and this relates back, I think we touched on again like the last meeting, the report that went to audit and governance last month was around where we've seen that the costs have increased in year, how can we actually introduce a, an increase in those charges there and then rather than just wait till the, the annual bud budget set in. And there are a few of those that we're looking at already, whether it's around our green waste bins, uh, uh, sorry, green waste bags, um, and areas, things like um, bulky waste collection and bereavement services. So some of those costs of delivering those services have gone up higher than you'd expect in the year. And we're just considering a report that would go through to the, the cabinet members to make those decisions on any in-year increases. Um, again, within the sort of long list of opportunities, there were some that were already in, in train and we were doing those and we touched on those last time in, in, in as part of our budget savings uh, proposals and we'll be presenting that report back as well. There are a number that are recommended, sorry, there, there are a number that are re recommended not to proceed and again as, fine, as part of the final report that would go to Cabinet as part of the budget setting, those will be set out in terms of why they're not procedural at this time. So until we finish that piece of work to actually be able to say why we can't do it. Um, but we touched on one or two last time, I think, around the um, things like a, a bedroom levy that has be, been introduced in the like, uh, areas such as Manchester. We're, we're recommending that that's not uh, proceeded at this time because we don't feel that the, the uh, visitor economy for the county could proceed with that.
this slide then covers some of the, the areas that were covered in the uh, Community Wellbeing Directorate. Um, and again, we, we covered some of this last time. The Council Lottery we're looking at in terms of a business case that will be presented to Cabinet in the next couple of months. Um, when just working through the, the cost of setting up such a lottery, but then actually how that would benefit the, the local community groups um, and how we can actually get more people engaged in that to, to see that the, the benefits of actually uh, not only supporting groups through the, the lottery, but actually signing up to support those groups in other ways as well. Um, the reintroduction of library fines, again, I think we talked on last time, which was just that we stopped charging because people weren't returning books during the, the uh, COVID lockdown. Um, and that was just a case of switching that, that fine back on. Um, but we've had to sort of reprofile the, the income generation from that because we're not expecting the, the same levels of, of fines that we might have seen pre-COVID. And then there's a similar list of, uh, a long list of opportunities for, sorry, on the, on the next slide, um, long list of opportunities for both children's um, and corporate. Wait for the slide to move on. Um, which again, there, there are a few in these areas. Um, one of the ones around children and young people, we've, we've just moved actually back to my director, it was around the cost of uh, delivering school crossing patrols. Um, for us, it's, it, it's beyond the, it, it's more than the cost of delivering that service. It's actually what's the benefit of school crossing patrols in terms of encouraging people, uh, children to walk to school, uh, reducing short journeys. And so we're, we're, we're just marrying out the, the, the sort of, you know, it's not just about reducing the cost of some of these services, it's actually thinking about the wider benefits of doing that. So as I said, there are four business cases that are proceeding at this stage, and we've, we've set out the details of those. They'll be coming forward for decisions in, in the next couple of weeks. The, the quick wins and, and um, small wins will go through as a delegated decision, and we'll be able to present those uh, to the cabinet members as well. And then there's ongoing work around the transformation program. Um, you asked last time around specifically where, where are those commercial opportunities? And again, we're just working through that. So as part of both the areas in the, we've got a regulatory service transformation program, um, planning service transformation program, and a licensing service tran transformation. Each of those is picking up those commercial aspects. And as we've got more details that we can present um, to, to cabinet and then bring back to scrutiny, we will do those. And then finally, there's just a, a timeline just to confirm some of the, the work packages that are there. As I said, the, the main focus is actually on the, the business cases that are coming forward for further development, and then some of those quick wins that need to be signed off now, and then the ongoing feasibility work for, for future opportunities that we'll be presenting back as we've done the work to, to present those. Okay, thank you for thank you for that. Um, that was uh, quite a whistle stop, uh, quite a whistle stop tour. Um, you mentioned that uh, that the going digital was a very big part of being able to deliver on and embed some of the um, transformational changes that have been identified. There's a really big price tag associated with that. What, what, is, what is the commitment and what is the risk of not being able to realise the benefits and the savings of these transformational changes? because of the price tag associated with the, um, the digital program? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, so a part, part of the development of the business cases around um, the Thrive and all the, also, the again, the individual projects, we will be looking at what the investment is needed and then obviously then look then against what the recovery of that's going to be and how that's going to be undertaken, what transformation program we need to put in place and what's the service delivery model afterwards to be able to um, recover some of that, that upfront investment. So that's part of the work that we're doing at the moment in terms of becoming that digitally, digital by default organisation, you know, what that level of investment absolutely needs to be um, and how we look to, um, you know, we, 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 I suppose we um, have the money in return in terms of that transformational <coughs> journey. Part of the um, pilots that sort of um, Ross has just described is testing some of that as well. So we've got some um, automated 
pilots already in place that's kind of testing that in terms of if um, our customers are going to use it, how they're using it, um, and um, what the what the returns are on that. I'd also say that the, uh, the the initial responses on those automated pilots is very positive. Uh, a, a few questions were raised at me that uh, it's uh, it's using the AI to to pick up on voice instead of press one for this or two for that. You just speak in natural voice and. Uh, a few questions were raised to me, A, with my Scottish accent, and B, with a good, thick Hepreforian accent, will it work? And yes, it does. It works very well. Well, that's that's encouraging. And presumably, will that be coming forward as a business case as part of the, uh, uh, the budget process? Sorry, in terms of the investment into the digital? Yes. Um, I, I'd need to double check that in terms of if that is going to be aligned into this budget or whether it's going to be for the for for future. Because um, ultimately, this also comes down to the target operating model in terms of how you know the the operating model that the organisation wants to go take forward. Which obviously there's a sort of a wider conversation on that. So um, I'd need to double check the the timescales on that. I thought the business case had been written for those four parts. The, sorry, the business cases for those yeah. four have been, but in terms of the wider investment into the digital across the whole organisation. I'll have to confirm those timescales with you. Yeah, I think what, what I'm concerned to, to be assured on <coughs> is that the business cases that are coming forward for the individual quick wins, early wins, are not predicated on a downstream investment in digital that we haven't committed to and can't afford. So the, the only examples of quick wins are on the, the ones we've mentioned already, which are the uh, uh, the examples being book and recent, uh, recycling centre application or checker planning application and so on and so forth, things like that. Okay. Um. And the business cases for the, for that 520k, was it four, about three months ago, Amy? Yeah. yeah, they were all signed off by me five months ago, about, about three months ago. For those four, those four business cases that came through. Okay, which, which so that ties into the previous administration spent about seven hundred and thirty for the PwC, and the reason that we've gone with PwC again is to build. They've got the understanding of what we're trying to do with our digital transformation program, and therefore, when we went to the second phase, which was the pilots, we went back with PwC for that five hundred and twenty k. Committee members, have you got any questions on uh, on what you've just seen? Councillor Baker, to begin with. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm just wondering if there are any services that we provide at a cost that we're running at a loss. Um, you may have mentioned it, Ross, earlier, <coughs> but I had a bit of a bit of a blank for a few minutes there. <laughs> but uh, it would be interesting to know if we have any that we run at a loss that we may maybe need to increase the cost. I think there's a difference between the, the ones where we can charge for a service as opposed to those that are delivered as part of our statutory responsibilities. Um, what this is particularly focused on is those where we can levy a charge that it is the right charge for doing so. Um, saying that there may be times where, you know, as a as, as an authority, we we say that the, we'd rather offset the additional cost of doing that because the wider benefit is there. Um, I mean, I gave school cost and patrols not because there's a cost we wouldn't charge, we don't charge for that, but actually the wider benefit of providing that service because it does encourage you know, children to walk to school is far more than the cost of providing that service. So that, that's where we would just try and sort of consider the, the, the balance in that to how much it costs versus uh, the opportunity to recover those charges. I, I think the, the one I was thinking about was planning applications and possibly the waste services when they come out and pick up large objects but of course, if we charge too much for that, we'll end up with fly tips. So uh, it's, a, it's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, so so planning breaks down into sort of a couple of different areas. I mean, there is the statutory fees. So you know, for depend on the size of the application, um, then there is a fee for that. But there are <laughs> additional services that we can provide. And we've talked before around um, pre-application advice and some of the additional yeah. services that we can provide. So they're the ones that we would be looking to recover the costs at you know, a, a maximum rate. Um, 
I think on, on waste collections, you're right. I mean, we, we want to encourage people to, to reuse as much as possible. So any sort of cost of collecting bulky items is, is, is not really ideal because we'd rather that the, the um, items are either reused or um, you know, repurposed in some way. But we need to make sure that we will, you know, we will cover that at, at the true cost. Can I also mention that uh, we, we do review our costs for a lot of those services with uh, our local uh, uh, other counties, Worcester, Worcester Shropshire, Powys, etc., and our, our charges are about equitable with them. Councillor Matthews. Yes, it concerns me greatly to hear what you're saying. There's people out there now that are really struggling and with an anticipated council tax rise as well, Mr. Cook, you should be looking very, very carefully at where you can save money. You know, it's all very simple to say stick an extra pound on car parks and all the rest of it. That has an impact on the city centre, uh, businesses, etc. So it's widespread, so I would be one that would not support that. And, and uh, so you've got to look very, very carefully and look to start to make savings within the department without just simply slapping on the cost for those people out there that are just about as far as they can go. And by pushing more pressures and more expense onto them is going to be extremely damaging. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, I, I can give you the assurance that uh, uh, as we go through the revenue uh, uh, budget plans and discussions with cabinet your your, your opinions are well rep represented in, the, in that cabinet and including my, my voice as well so we're very very aware of what we have to do councillor stark um well i'm trying to see where we're going with this have we got an overall target for what we want to either save or raise from this transformation program it seems to me that that would be an obvious sort of approach to try and focus uh, the, and where you might actually want to take forward some of the the quick wins and the big wins council store that so is there an overall target you have in mind uh, uh, yes council there is I'll, I'll just pass across to uh to ross and to amy to answer that one in specific Yeah, I mean, it's being broken down into, so service cost recovery, would, as I said, we're, we're working through the long list of opportunities um, and then seeing what a reasonable target would be in terms of efficiencies and also increased costs and certainly take on board Councillor Matthew's comments around you know, not overcharging for, for services. It needs to be affordable to, to all of our residents. Um, but as I said in the introduction, there is a, a wider piece of work being done in terms of what the transformation of the whole organisation would look like. Um, so you know, each aspect of our, our Thrive programme has to have a both a targeted figure, but actually it's around the efficiencies and how we're going to work differently. So it's not going to be set that in next year there'll be you know, a set amount that would be um, achievable because it's a long-term sort of sustain, uh, sustainable organisation that we were looking at. So as part of, as, as you said in your, your earlier comments, you know, the clarity around the council plan and what the priorities are, then we can set the, the, the budgets aligned to that and the savings and transformation programme needs to be part of that conversation. But normally when we get the, the Remy budget presented to us, Ross, we have by directorate efficiency savings, cost pressures, and in your directorate particularly, where we expect to increase our income streams. Are we going to have that again at some stage? Because, Chair, we're having a very general discussion at the moment. At the end of the day, what matters here is what is the bottom line, and, and that's what concerns me. Are we going to see something out of this that will help in terms of our revenue budget setting next year? Yes, it most definitely will. It, it, it may be seen as a, a spend uh, to accumulate, but we, we will definitely... We are, we're spending this money in order to make our services more efficient and actually better and uh, cost us less to deliver those services to our, our uh, residents. And to develop income streams as well, of course, Councillor Stoddart. I think that's really important because going back to what Councillor Matthews said, 
if we can develop income streams that are, at least if they're not neutral, at least have a sense of discretion in terms of whether our residents want to spend the money or not, for example, a lottery scheme, that would be much more acceptable because at the end of the day, then it's down to the resident as to whether they spend the money on it or not. So I think that's quite important and the balance between what you're taking. Yep. So yeah. PwC have come up with, as uh, as Ross alluded to, a long list of potential items. Uh, we are looking at each of those in Cabinet, uh, discounting some, taking some further forward for further discussion. Uh, and it was the lottery one that uh, I was quite keen to see. It's, uh, I believe, uh, the previous administration had discussed it, uh, but that we we would like to now bring it forward and see if it's another option to go forward for. It's not going to be signi hugely significant. But every small bit, as we say, prudently helps. Councillor Cole. With, with regard to the planning uh, um, charges, I know some of it's all set by the government, as you said. But when we met last, you were going to look in to see whether that still applied to retrospectives. Because I'd like to see the retrospective put high enough to discourage people from doing it after the event and come into the planning system earlier. And do it properly. You, you are absolutely right, Councillor Colin. Apologies, I haven't covered that one off, but I, I do need to check on that. The, the one thing that I, I should also have said is that um, government announced just last week that the the planned increase in uh, planning charges will come into effect from the sixth of December. Um, we were expecting that to have come in from April this year, um, but it was delayed. So we, we we just had notification last week. So there will be a change in terms of. The, the cost of um, both minor and major applications, but I'll, I'll come back to you and confirm that point. Councillor Cornthwaite. Um, when this, when this report um, came to us a couple of weeks ago, one of the things I asked was what was the actual price of the consultancy? Um, now, I think uh, Councillor Stoddart has mentioned two, threw, threw away two figures there, which uh, I, I think sort of appall somebody like me that to think you would spend seven hundred and thirty thousand pounds on a consultancy. Did I catch that figure right? Because the question I was asking two weeks ago was, what do we need to charge to recover the consultancy fee? And my big concern about the consultancy is that it probably is being paid to consultants that are not in our county, and could we not employ people? within the council to uh, and and bring forth what appears to me is they brought forward 84 ideas but now it's we that are deciding which of the 84 ideas are worth any any money to us so somebody in Hereford could have <coughs> put forward 84 ideas uh, if we'd just gone around on the streets and asked them um, so I'm, I'm really concerned about consultancy fees I think they're a huge drain and I want to make sure that w somewhere we can recover that money. Thank you, Councillor. Your, your, your points are mirrored by me. However, uh, the skills that we require these people to, to have do not exist in, in the Council, as we say. The business skills, the, the, uh, the digital transformational skills, they do not below, we do not have those skills. And if we were to bring them in as part of our, our uh, workplace strategy, they would cost a significant amount of money to have them for a long period of time where we may not need them for all that time whereas consultants if we can bring them in to do the tasks that we wish to you're you're, you're right that the, the 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 fees are eye-watering uh but that is the reality of where we are we used as i explained earlier we've used for a second phase pwc because that's who was done that's who were employed previously for phase one and it made sense to bring them in for phase two to prevent having to relearn and, and re-establish the baseline on it. Um, as I say, though, the, the skills that they bring, it, it, it's not quite as simple as walking outside with a, with a chalkboard and asking uh, some people in, in Hightown for some ideas. These are basically uh, uh, an agency who have been doing this across not just the UK, but across the world on ideas, and that's where they came from. Anything else you'd like to add on that, sir? Any further? No, I mean, I think Councillor Stoddart has covered it in, in some detail. I mean, we certainly take the point that, yeah, there, there has to be a return on that sort of investment. But as I was saying to the previous question, really, it's around that longer term sustainability of the organisation. So it's not going to be a you pay out now and, and the return is there straight away. 
um, so the organization will change over time particularly the the digital transformation that will take some in, um, some investment and we will see the change in the way that we work and and how we operate I think the again take the point around you know, where possible you would take s some sort of local um, support and advice particularly if it was in, in a consultancy approach um, but there's also that who who's got access to the market so for, for service cost recovery in particular um, PwC are well versed in doing that sort of work and, in, in, and looking at the comparable authorities to see what the charges are and understanding the business so there's that bit of balance there in terms of who, who's best in the market to provide that service um, but then we need to make sure that the cost of delivering all of that yeah, that, that consultancy is recovered in, in total um, but it's not just around service cost recovery it's around that customer journey it's around the digital transformation it's all, all aspects of the transformation programme Any more questions on um, on Ross's presentation? Okay. Um, well, part of this agenda item is uh, a number of appendices uh, which relate to um, how we are managing our property portfolio. And we've got Sarah Jowett with us today. Thank you very much, Sarah, um, who's provided this information. Uh, the reason that I've asked for it is because it's another dimension of the way we generate income. Uh, we have a... Oh, dear. Who's that? <laughs> Councillor Matthews. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, if you can see me later, we'll discuss you, we'll discuss you providing a, a limerick as a... As a punishment for that. Um, so the the uh, one of the ways in which we generate income is because we have a, a, a property portfolio. Some of that property um, houses us here in this building, um, and uh, the other service areas of the council in other buildings um, around the county. Uh, but we also have a commercial um, property portfolio where we um, uh, have tenants and generate income. Um, and we've made a number of investments over the years in purchasing property specifically to generate an income for the council. And that's why we've got um, some of the information uh, here, just providing a bit of background. Um, for example, on two of those investments, um, one is the uh, the Three Arms Trading Estate, as an example, which was bought a few years ago from the, um, was it the Homes and Communities Agency? Um, and um, we made a significant investment on College Road in purchasing um, some uh, buildings and land uh, that used to belong to the Blind College. Um, and uh, there's a bit of information about the, uh, the cases that were made um, at the time for each of those, um, each of those investments. Um, we've also got some information on the um, asset management um, strategy and the programme for that and how we are undertaking asset management and you know I'm I'm really grateful that this has given us the opportunity to to have that um, that summary of, of what uh, what's been going on in um, uh, investing in and developing the um, the property management arm of the council it's been a long journey um, and it's been hard hard miles um, in uh, taking a more uh, business-like uh, and rigorous approach to the way that we understand and manage our asset portfolio. So thank you very much for the, uh, the documents which are uh, summarising the approach that we're taking here. I think for me, in the context of what we're trying to do here, looking at um, income and charging, um, and I, I recognise there is um, a, a confidentiality and commercial sensitivity around um, providing lots of detail on this, but I think at, 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 a, at a high level and from a scrutiny perspective, 
Um, I'm keen that we, we seek some assurance that the investments that this council has made over the years using public money in acquiring commercial assets that are then um, traded, that those are washing, not only washing their face financially in terms of covering their own cost <coughs> of ownership and maintenance and so forth, but they are actually delivering an appropriate return to the public purse as commercial assets, as part of the overall income generating strategy that we have as a council. Um, and that detail isn't isn't there in the work we've just got the raw information here so um, I wonder if there's any assurance that can be provided to us today in the room on how we're doing on um, making sure that our commercial uh, property portfolio is delivering a return on the investment <coughs> made that is appropriate to that investment and to um, the local economy. Thank you, Chair. So um, you're, you're, you're very correct in that uh, we have not got a, a great history of charging appropriate rents. Uh, so I've been uh, assured by the S151 officer that <coughs> over this summer, a complete review of all of our commercial rents has taken place based on best practice of what's charged locally. So we're not overcharging. We just want to make sure we're getting the re the relevant in, uh, commercial property rent back in. And I can confirm that that is now taking place and all of our rents are now at, at the requisite level of, a, of an equitable commercial property. And we're now receiving them for the last two or three months. That That is a huge step forward that is massive and it was a huge piece of work yeah. Ab absolutely and i think you know it i don't underestimate the, the the difficulty that that has presented in terms of um managing expectations for our our, our tenants and um making sure that people understand that 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 being a tenant of a of a commercial property owned by the council is not it's it, it it's not a it's not at a at a reduced level this is this is a commercial operation which is there to generate income to offset the cost of services yep. and the, and the lease as well uh, i think i'm correct so the lease have all been reconfirmed so they're actually they're standalone leases so it's okay it's very clear what you pay what you get for that and what we expect back from you so previously where some leases may not have been there, some rents were there, it's very clear now what, what actually the tenant is, is, can expect and what we can expect back from the tenant. Okay, we've had a lot of dust kicked up over the last um, year and more from some of our tenants who have um, uh, the kind of leases that require them to cover property maintenance costs themselves. Um, which they haven't always been doing um, and it's come as a bit of a shock to them when um, large investment has been required in the property um, and they've turned to the council to, uh, to make that investment and have been disappointed when their repairing lease arrangements have been, um, they've been held to. Um, are we making sure that repairing lease arrangements are both understood and being kept to by our tenants so that we don't see those properties gradually dilapidating? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, it's a long process and a long road, as you say, and we're still getting there. The standardisation of approach, though, is absolutely critical. Otherwise, um, we, we, we undermine our position with all of our tenants. And as an authority, it's really important that we treat everyone fairly. So you're absolutely right. Where we have full repair and obligations, that is our position. We always try to make sure that we advise any new tenants that they seek professional independent advice so that 
we we can advise them and they understand the legal documents they're signing into. We've also worked with Talk Community and we've put a guide up on the website for um, the smaller community or local businesses and it actually explains the terms and the processes around taking out a lease and the legal implications and financial risks that they're also taking. So yes, it's, it's, it's work in progress, but we're trying really hard to consolidate the position that we're in with existing leases, but also to help and support where we can going forward. Councillor Hamblin and then Councillor Cornfight. Uh, subject. Uh, do you have any sort of figures and can you quantify the improvement in terms of pounds per annum that you might be looking to achieve for the, the new rent levels and so on? Um, yes. Um, the council has employed external agents, which was to attend the process to do the management of the rents and lease reviews for us over a period of a couple of years now. And that was kicked off by Councillor Harvey and Councillor Davis previously. So um, we'll, we, we can share privately some of the figures. Clearly, there is some commercial sensitivities. But as a, as a view, we increased on tranche one, which is 21 properties. We raised that by just under 35%. Now, that's just bringing the rents up to market levels. So several of our um, tenancies had not been renewed in quite a long time. And we understood the impact on our tenants of some of these rent increases as well. So we have worked with them where possible. Um, phase two, which it, we're just finishing off with 65 properties, and that's gone up again by about 34%. Now, these are all market value, so they are valued depending on where they are, the size, the scope, the, the, um, the nature and, and, and the condition. And we're just starting phase three now, which we've started this year, so we would anticipate clearly um, probably not that amount of rise in the future um, because we're starting to go back now and that will be a rolling programme so that the rent reviews are, are, are done on, on, on a rolling programme and we intend to procure for that rolling programme as well which will hopefully bring the cost down but the, the cost of doing that service has, has been really um, um, good, good value and, and quite a low percentage of, of, of the rents gained. Convention as well. So picking up on going back to Councillor Cornthwaite's previous point about uh, cost of consultancies, this is an example whereby we have used a consultancy, and you can see straight away that the income is now paying that charge back. Councillor Cornthwaite, <laughs> the decision to increase rents, I know from the other side, although I don't have a council property but I do I, I'm adjacent to some down on Rotherwas that did and found that some of my neighbours had moved down to Ross where they were able to get bigger premises for less money have you been able to refill those premises that were vacated would be my question um, yes on the whole we have a really strong demand actually so we appreciate that we've lost some tenants as part of this process for various reasons Sometimes uh, they, they can't afford where they are. Sometimes they want bigger or smaller units or to consolidate. And that's always um, disappointing. But the reports that we receive, the market reports from the agents that we employ, are very comprehensive. And they, they use comparables you know, with units that have previously been let. So, for example, on our estates, where we've already re-let units um, nearby, we will use that as a comparable rate and we know that there is strong demand for them so um, yes un unfortunately we have lost and some some of our tenants have really good reasons as well why they are struggling uh, and that's that makes it really hard but again we've got to standardize our approach I can't treat one tenant differently than another and and, and that's the message and we try and work with people as much as we can Councillor Chowns. Um, move on slightly. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to... Um, I've, I've got two questions. I'll ask the 
I'll ask the, the non-substantive one perhaps first, which is just that, on the, I can't find the right page, but just towards the end, <coughs> looking at, where is it? Anyway, there's, there's something that says manage the terrier. What's the terrier? I mean, surely that's not a small dog that somebody's got responsibility for. Um, no, but it could work well in the in in as part of the workplace st strategy, of course. Um, Well-being <laughs> improvements. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> the the terrier is basically our asset data, so it's really important for us um, that all of the data around the assets we own, that we lease, boundary responsibilities, roles and responsibilities, who does what etc uh, any covenants restrictions all that is contained on what we call a terrier so sorry and yeah, another thing. more jargon, another jargon. <laughs> yeah sorry more jargon <laughs> all right if the, well if this is for public consumption it might be worth it might be worth clarifying that um my more substantive um point is is relating to the environmental impact of the buildings that we hold it's crucially important to recognize this in our estates strategy I think um, I've, you know, when on the other side of the table, this was an issue that I was trying to champion and I can't see that recognised anywhere in this document. I don't know if I've missed it. Uh, there's a brief reference to sort of proactively managing assets in relation to purpose, service, need and expected future. I don't, I don't know if there's a word missing at the end of that or if that is a reference to in relation to the expected future of a world in which climate change means that we need to both have more better adapted buildings and also do everything that we can to uh, mitigate uh, the climate impact of those buildings. There's brief reference on page 18 to delivering against the county plan, which again is clear on this. We've got a strong council corporate commitment to reducing uh, the impact of climate change and indeed to being zero carbon by 2030. And it is crucial that we drive forward action on this. So. Please, could that be written in? Thanks. Um, just, just on that one, I've, I've just done a quick search, and car the carbon footprint management is referenced throughout the stamp. So, with that's our strategic plan, um, and of course, it it uh, relates to the carbon management plan. So, we took a really big decision. We weren't going to duplicate anything. We would refer to it, but actually, what what we have underneath the strategic asset management plan, the stamp, is a framework of documents. And the achieving decarbonisation of the corporate state is actually one of those documents that sets out a specific strategy. And one of the things I did is put together a low carbon working group, working with Ben and his team and others, uh, including schools as well. Mm. And over a period of time, we met on a monthly basis and we developed that, that procedure together. And that's been through CLT and approved. So um, what I'm hoping to do, we've got, we've got one document um, left and then what we'll have is a complete suite of documents that sit underneath the strategic plan. So the management um, or uh, historic assets, the, um, the maintenance strategy, the commercial and investment uh, plan, all of those main documents will sit underneath that and that's one of those documents. I'm happy to send it to you if you haven't got it already. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Crockett and then Councillor Stark. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, my... My concern is about maintenance of buildings, of our assets, um, not management of the maintenance. You know, we've had some really big spends on trying to repair buildings that we own. Um, and my question really is, who actually monitors the maintenance program that we have with our assets? <coughs> So annually, we put a capital bid forward, which is based upon two aspects. One is the condition surveys that we've got, and it pulls out the priorities from that. And the second one is other works that come forward if throughout the year then that, that need to go forward. So we put a capital bid in every year for, a, um, for major works. The rest of it, of course, is done under reactive maintenance on a day-to-day -day basis. So things do change. We also have an emergency budget capital budget which we utilise as well throughout the year. Um, we can only of course deliver works depending upon the budget that's been allocated and also the in the recent years the, the cost of materials and labourers has just rocketed so that does limit our ability to deliver 
but we, we are trying really hard to work with local contractors. We, I think the council does have an issue with contractors wanting to work for us as well. And sometimes we have to, um, for more specialist jobs, we've had to go out to tender about three times. So there are lots of different factors, but we do try to bring forward a programme that will deliver a, um, a proactive maintenance programme and then deal with the reactive as well. I think proactive is much better than reactive. Councillor Stark. Yeah, just, just two points. Um, can we have reassurance, Councillor Stark, that, that our exposure as a commercial landlord will not have the same impact on this council as it has on other councils? I mean, I don't need to mention some, but there's been some real horror stories out there about badly made commercial investments where the actual um, impact on the on the council has been up to to actually um, have to sustain several losses in terms of millions rather than actually gaining an income from this so I'm just concerned about that reassurance that this is not exposing us to any long-term loss in the future I'm pretty certain it's not as big as some of the other councils but I'd like that reassurance the second one is, uh, looking at the history of this chair, thanks for that, I really can't find any sort of, um, I, I think, happiness in these figures, to be honest, because sitting in Ross, I mean, all I see is we bought a property in Hereford. We brought another property in Hereford. We've invested more in Hereford. I don't see the asset management plan as benefiting the whole county or hasn't benefited the whole county up to now. And that's a worry for me. A lot of these decisions have been made in isolation and include main lords and that. And while it's benefited Hereford overall in terms of all these different transactions, we haven't really used our asset approach to benefit the whole county and the market towns in particular. And I really would want to ask us to actually think about that moving forward, Councillor Stoddart, because I think that's a really missed opportunity. That's my final point, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stark. So first of all, if I go back onto the, the financial risk, uh, I think you're probably losing to people like uh, Croydon and places like that who had all sorts of, uh, and Thurrick as well. Uh, I, I can assure you that we have nothing commercially that is uh, highly, highly uh, riskable. Uh, and in fact, I will mention at Cabinet later on this week that our 2022-2023 audit report has now been signed off by Grant Thornton and they give us a complete green, and that includes a review of all of our capital portfolios. So there is no concerns there. Uh, to go on to the second point, uh, I, I share your concern. We we tend to buy, or over uh, historically, we've been buying properties in Hereford because that's where people want to have them. But certainly going forward, we will look countywide where if that's if there are commercial opportunities that we believe are viable we will look to to, uh, to purchase properties elsewhere it's more than that council stored at these are opportunity costs that mean that for example model farm has not been developed in 16 years because you spending on these property uh, purchases means that you're not spending money on redeveloping model farm for example so there have been opportunities there to do something more widely across the county but because you're buying properties in hereford you're, you're, you're tying up the money that could be used to develop perhaps even land that we owned elsewhere, particularly employment land. So I, I do think the opportunities have been there. I don't think we've actually followed them in the past. You, you have a valid point, uh, Councillor, I, 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 uh, and you're referring back to 15 years ago, where uh, it was quite a while ago. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, we are looking from a, the employment land perspective, as we talked about with Model Farm, of we wish to, to get that in and working uh, phase one as soon as possible. Uh, but certainly what I'm saying to you from a commercial property perspective, we will look, keep a very open mind around the county if, the, if properties come around it that we believe would be useful uh, and add, a, add something extra to our portfolio. Okay, could, could I make a suggestion then that as far as our commercial property portfolio is concerned, in order to provide assurance that we are generating an appropriate return for the investment made, um, that 
as part of the information that is provided with the budget, we have, and I don't mind if it's exempt papers that are produced um, for um, members' eyes only, um, that we have some um, documentation provided which identifies what the um, the costs, uh, the investment, um, sorry, the, the cost, the operating costs, the uh, original investment, the current value, um, and the income um, for our uh, each of our commercial um, property uh, items. However, it is they're they're handled whether they're grouped um, or whether they are um, standalone sort of individual um, investments. Uh, and that as far as income is, and charging is concerned, that it isn't buried in the budget in a way that nets out to figures for the directorates, that we actually have some clarity on where income is being generated and that we have some those targets, if targets there are, um, you know, clearly identified as part of demonstrating that we are making every effort to generate income in order to assist with the overall um, delivery of services um, and cover of costs uh, for the council as a whole. What I may look at, not obviously the Q2 report is, is in process now, but perhaps in the in the Q3 report, where you know we have the, uh, the income uh, uh, annex, which includes the interest and payments we get from there. I will sp I will look to see if we can get a, an, an additional annex which covers commercial property returns. Now, I'm I'm happy for it to be part of the budget rather than something that you try and um, adjust in terms of how you're presenting information in year. Okay. Um, but certainly in terms of how we we have the information presented for the budget go and going forward, that we are clear with ourselves and with the public that we are actually generating income um, appropriately from um, service cost recovery where we think that's right and that we are making sure that our investments are delivering a return to the public purse. Yes. Thank you. Um, is, that, is that broadly supported as a recommendation from the committee? I'm seeing lots of nods and hands going up, excellent. Um, the recommendations associated with this agenda item um, are that we note the appendices. So thank you for those. And um, uh, Ross, thank you for the, um, the slides that were presented as an update. And if we can have those to uh, append to the minutes, please. Um, thank you, committee members. We're now on to the last agenda item, which I'm hoping we can uh, dispense with um, quite briskly. Um, these are the um, yes, it, yes, it is. Um, do we need to take a vote to carry the meeting on for a few more minutes? If the chairperson may determine that. Okay. Well, I'd like us to see if we can dispose of the last item on the agenda because it's just setting up a task and finish group to look specifically at children's. I I know there's another meeting that we all need to to go to quite briskly. So, um, with your indulgence, if we can, um, if we can take this item uh, swiftly, we're looking at um, agreeing the form of the task and finish group according to the terms of reference which are appended to the report at agenda item 10. Does anybody have any comments or amendments that they'd like to make to those terms of reference as published? No? Can I uh, can I seek um, approval to um, to go ahead with them then? Right, excellent. Okay. Well, I think we've disposed of that agenda item then, and um, therefore it it only is for me to say that the date of the next meeting is Tuesday the sixteenth of January. Uh, except it won't be because we're going to have an extraordinary meeting um, to, to be determined uh, on the date in December, which will be dedicated to looking at um, 
uh, supporting documents for the budget. So that's exciting, isn't it, everyone? Well, we look forward to that. Um, uh, but Tuesday the 16th of January will be the follow-on meeting where we will look at the budget in detail. Thank you very much. Uh, closing the meeting at um, 17.08.